if there had even just been a glance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like a blush at one point or something. One time, I wouldn't have forgotten it. I'd have been like, oh, he likes her. Mm -hmm. you know he gave her I mean? his car. So that I happened. Her family was murdered in front of her <laughs> and he rescued her from sexual traits like sex slavers. Yeah, he gave her a scarf. <laughs> hey, good man right there. everyone, welcome to the Izakaya Studios Anime Podcast. This is a special episode that we'll be discussing the ending of the Attack on Titan manga and just giving other thoughts on the series as a whole. I am your standard host for this episode, uh, Sretin, SP Kuma, and I also have Taylor. Hello! Johan. Hi, are you? And Justin. Hey, everyone. And I'll leave it up to you guys. Cool. Sounds Thanks good. for that fantastic introduction, ah, Sretin. That thank was you. awesome. Yeah, it only took a few times. <laughs> So to open up this special for Attack on Titan, uh, we're primarily going to be going over our thoughts on the last chapter. Um, but just to start us off, um, we Justin actually mentioned a great idea would be to talk about how we each got introduced into Attack on Titan. And so I thought I'd let Justin start off with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, man, I can't believe it's been 12 years that Attack on Titan has now finally come to its conclusion. I definitely... Didn't remember it being that long, um, but to your point, Taylor, you know, for me, the first time that I was introduced to Attack on Titan was with the airing of the anime originally, um, and it wasn't until the end of season one and kind of, you know, this this great ensemble of characters and music score from uh, Hiroyuki Sawano that really dragged me in, and, and I just kind of said to myself, like, man, I can't wait. I need to know more, and that's when I, you know, transferred over to the manga counterpart, so interested to hear from you guys. You switched over to manga at the end of the first season? Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I felt a little bit like an imposter this whole time when you say, oh, man, I can't believe it's been 12 years. Like, it sounds like you've been following it for a long time. I didn't start watching Attack on Titan until season two was done. So I got mm, to binge okay. the, the first two seasons of anime. And then um, I did not go to the manga yet. I was I really wasn't a manga reader yet. So I didn't switch to the manga until the end of season three, um, mm -hmm. mostly just because once they introduced Marley at the end of season three, it was just so much information. And I just hate when I can't like figure so when I can't categorize information really well, it, it, <laughs> I needed to know more. So I switched to the manga immediately. I think I read like 10 chapters that night. <laughs> and, and what made you, you know, as you were saying, you know, season two wrapping up and that being kind of the, the pivotal moment to actually jump into the series. Like how, how did you go about doing that? Was it just that you were seeing a lot of hype for it on, you know, Reddit, were you hearing it from friends that were kind of raving about it or. Yeah, I think I just heard a, I just heard good things about it, I think is really all it came down to. And I was just like, I'm newer to anime. I watched brother like FMA Brotherhood back in high school. And I watched uh, not Code Geass, Gundam Seed <laughs> back okay. in high school. Those were the only two anime I'd ever seen other than like Pokemon. And so uh, I just heard really, really good things about it. So I watched this and then Death Note. So I got the, the big ones out <laughs> to hey, begin with. Solid choice to start with for sure. So, yeah. What, what about you, Johan? How did you get introduced to this series? I was in Mexico watching like YouTube videos about animes, like random animes. And then I saw these, like the first time I saw, I think it was when I became a Titan. I thought like it was like a very, 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 very good fan made because they were like, I've never heard about this before. And it looks pretty sick. What is this? <laughs> so I started looking into it and I went like, oh, it's called Attack on Titan. So I asked my friends, hey, have you watched this? It was like, the first season they went like no we haven't watched mm -hmm. it so i watched the first season and then i started researching okay when's the second season coming because i'm sure something's coming up mm -hmm. and i saw that it had been years and years and i went like you know what fuck it so i started like looking at the manga and everything and i went like yeah this is gonna be pretty good <laughs> i'll say nice. so you so you started reading the manga in that wait then between seasons one and two yeah, because I didn't okay. know when the season two was coming out. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, at least they want to know what's going to happen, you know? And like, it was like, they, I think everyone reads the manga because they want to realize what's in the basement. It's like, what's in the basement? <laughs> right. You're, you're kind of on the, the bleeding edge of knowledge where, you know, you're experiencing everything firsthand where for the anime folk, you know, they experience it in a different way, but it's always kind of that, uh, that contrast of like, oh man, like they don't know what we know as manga readers and kind of having that interesting dynamic at play as well. But, mm -hmm. Wow, I'm glad we hear we you know we had quite a diverse introduction to the series mm -hmm. in all our ways that we came into this. So 
Yeah. Actually, and shout out to all. To shout out to all the Attack on Titan fans that are out there that did have to live through that four or five year purgatory between seasons one and two that didn't go to the manga. Really, everybody feels for you. That was brutal. <laughs> yeah, I, I think even for the the manga readers, you know, the fact that Attack on Titan is a, a monthly serial mm-hmm. release, like that's even something as well with like, you know, these pivotal and cliffhanging moments that happen so often. It's just like, man, it hurts on both fronts. It hurts as an mm-hmm. anime viewer and it hurts both as a manga reader. And just when you have something like that, that truly is a testament to, you know, how good of this series this really was. So. Well, speaking of how good this series was, <laughs> maybe I bit my tongue or spoke too soon. <laughs> what um, I'm going to kind of focus on the last chapter here. We're going to kind of jump into that before we like kind of go over the series as a whole. So going into this last chapter, we've had several ch- we'd had several chapters of the fighting and some big uh, lore drops about Emir, things like that. What were you guys most looking forward to seeing a resolution to in the last chapter? Like, what was really important to you? It can be something silly. Like, this person can't die or I drop it. Or it can just be, you know, whatever. Drop it in the last episode. I will drop it. I will not read it again. <laughs> you drop it just, yeah, yeah, like 10 panels before the end. I'm never touching this this drag again. <laughs> hmm. um, That's so, a, yeah, what, what big questions did you question. have? Because I know, I know for me, I can go first. For me, okay. I was really curious about what the Titan centipede bug was. And I didn't really think for sure that we were going to get any specific answers about that. And I was okay. Because unless you have like a really rock solid idea for, for, for the inception of such a creature like that, mm-hmm. I think it's almost best to leave it ambiguous. Is like things happen, things exist that we don't know about. And this was just like a freak incident where, you know she got this bug in her you know those kind of things i think that's fine to leave it ambiguous but i was curious to see if he did anything more with it and i was really curious to know too basically what's uh what aaron's thought process was through this entire basically since marley got introduced and we definitely got some answers for that so i i felt satisfied i mean once i thought about it some more and digested it a couple of times yeah um i think for me i kind of had similar thoughts and kind of uh wants for clarification surrounding this uh this entity that was introduced you know the source of all living matter as isayama kind of explains for it and how you know it kind of takes over um ymir in in those flashbacks of her kind of falling into uh the river and and things um but it was one thing that i felt like you know we didn't get a clear resolution to which I guess in in the scheme of things in relative to other things i'm fine with that uh i feel like it was a little bit of weaker writing if i'm going to be honest i kind of like the original explanation of how ymir gets these titan abilities in terms of like this deal with the devil um and i think that would have completely been fine as is but i think the real big thing that i wanted to see a conclusion to and obviously we did get it and i'm sure as we'll talk later whether or not we're satisfied with that is how does aaron's story coming to an end you know we've we've seen him from season one as this bright-eyed you know shonen s figure type who's out to you know destroy all titans for these things that have occurred to his mother to those you know surrounding him and towards the end you know how do we get here as this pivotal antagonist that i can't help but relate to lelouch in some certain ways um really seeing how it all kind of comes to an end so that was really the biggest thing for me we will talk about that at length (laughs) same for me i was like the first thing that i wanted to know like when i as i was reading the last one it's gonna be like okay Am I going to remember Eren as Eren Jaeger, or am I going to remember Eren as Eren Vibritania? That was my main mm, thing. It was going to be like, like are they going to pull it? I'm pretty sure they will. I just want to <laughs> see how. And then also something that I was looking forward, I wanted a closure, you know, not a really, really open. Like anyone that reads the manga can go with the, oh, no, it's an open ending. But really, it's like, I feel like uh, Isayama really wanted to close things that say like, you know what? There's really not going to be anything else. Like. A final panel where someone like emerged from the you know the thing or probably the little warm thingy popping mm. out of the earth or something would be like okay there might be something else coming up but I think that they closed it pretty good and those are yeah. were the two things like Aaron's resolution and then is it gonna be a final final thing or open ended? I would have Makes laughed sense. so hard if there was a panel that did have like one of those little bugs sticking its, <laughs> like, its head out of like one of the trees or something. I'd be like, "That's really yeah. out of out of style, Isayama." So I'm mm. glad. I, I felt like it was 
regardless of anybody's opinions, I feel like it was like closed off. Like there could maybe be some side stories if he wants to like explore somebody else's future and what they were up to. Kind of like what JK Rowling does for Harry Potter or something. Um, if he really wanted to, but he doesn't have to. Like I felt like it was wrapped up and I don't need yeah more from the future, you know? I feel like the thing is too, like if I had to kind of put myself in Isayama's shoes, it's like, you know, figure that you've been doing this for 12 years. And I believe he said, you know, he's always had the ending kind of in his mind in advance. Um, and so I think as a manga writer, that's, you know, a good and bad thing to have, because sometimes maybe as you're kind of heading towards these final moments, maybe you do start to have doubts in your mind and you do kind of see the reception from um, your your viewer base and your audience of readers. Uh, but I think conversely to that, it's, it's a real positive in the sense, exactly as you said, Taylor, where it, it is that closure. And, and to Johan's point as well, like there's nothing left open to kind of discuss further, which I think is really great because if you don't do that, then you kind of set these expectations on your shoulders of like, all right, like, are we going to get, you know, a follow up if you tease something at the end or if you tease something and then it just goes radio silent? Like, that's just a a another kind of instance of like frustration that I could see from fans of just like, oh, man, like, I can't believe he did this. And I'm sure there would just be a lot of, you know, needs and wants of like, OK, we need this closure. So I'm glad we did get closure in that sense here with this final chapter. For sure, for sure. So with this last chapter, um, just as a brief recounting of events, uh, this last chapter covered Aaron's conversation with Armin, um, revealing his true feelings for Mikasa. We can talk about that more later. I feel like that needs to be examined. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, his reasoning behind uh, doing the rumbling and specifically with that 80% number um, that he kept mentioning, uh, he just there was that reveal of uh, what happened with his mom, Carla, and Dina as, in her Titan form, why she ate his mom. There's there's a lot that he talks about with, um, with Armin. And then eventually that conversation ends. Armin and Mikasa then in present time say their goodbyes to Aaron while Mikasa goes to bury him beneath that tree that he used to like to sleep under. Uh, meanwhile, everybody else that had been turned into pure Titans have reverted back uh, because... Amir is unshackled now. Uh, warriors are reunited with their families. Levi, Connie, and John all say goodbye to their fallen comrades, Comrades, which I feel like was a really poignant moment for a lot of fans. I've seen a lot of people talking about that, and I know for me it really stood out as well. Um, and then there is a brief standoff right after the fight of all the Eldians and humans because there's still that inherent distrust there. And then it finally skips three years into the future where we see that Paradis is strengthening their army. And that's actually named the Jaeger function. I had missed that the first time I read it. So when I reread it again today, for some reason, that's the time that it, that it stuck with me. And I was like, oh, OK, that's a nice little tribute to Aaron. That I makes suppose. sense. <laughs> um, still a lot of mistrust between um, the Paradis and Eldia amongst the rest of the world. Uh, so we see that all, basically most of our of our favorite characters and the ones that are still left alive are basically all working together as ambassadors of peace to share their story around the world and continue to try to be diplomatic with everybody else, a la real life. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the summary of what happened in the last chapter. Oh, oh no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot my least favorite part. One little thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the very, very ending where Mikasa goes and sits at that tree and a, and a bird wraps a scarf around her. I don't know. We'll talk about that some more, too. That's probably what closes it out. So. Considering that summary, uh, I came up with some outstanding items for things that we might still be wondering about. We can comment on that, or maybe I missed something, and maybe there is more of an answer. Um, let's, since it's the last thing I mentioned, that bird, what is everybody's mm -hmm. thoughts on, uh, <laughs> is it Erin reincarnated? Or is it just a bird, and she's just kind of placing her feelings on that bird? Or is everybody just looking into it too much? I mean, because it's a last scene, I feel like there was something like a little bit deeper that we, I was supposed to mm -hmm. feel from it. But I kind of just laughed. So how did everybody else feel? I feel like Mikasa, that shows how sick and how, you know, how sad and how traumatized Mikasa was with the whole Eren thing. Because mm -hmm. let's be real, like if it was Eren, if it was a reincarnation of Eren, then you would be like, wait, so is there a chance that like the Titan realm, when Aaron talked to everyone, like that interconnection that there was, it's still there? Mm 
-hmm. Like, because Yumira, then she was like, okay, fine, I'm done with it. And when everyone turned back into a Titan, I feel like that was like, okay, it's the end of the Titan era. There's nothing else. And then I feel like it's almost like for me, when that bird, like, Isayama made a lot of references to birds. You know, flying was a main, main thing. Like, it was very important throughout the story, especially at the ending. And then, of course, Falco flying, the freaking flying Titan. And then mm -hmm. the birds, like, when Armin is in the boat, like, just thinking. And then he sees the bird, and the bird is looking at him almost, like, when he's talking with Annie. Um, it's like, you know, birds are very important. But I don't, I personally think that it wasn't Eren. Because, one, if it was Eren then the plot would be like, so technically Eren's still alive, like not a reincarnation, but like this, if the soul of Eren is there, that means that the souls of every other Titan shifter is there somewhere, including Ymir, mm -hmm. including everyone. So it would be like, you know, that could be problematic. I think that it showed that Mikasa's, like, Mikasa's world was around Eren. So every single thing that happens to Mikasa is going to be related to Eren. When the thing was flying, like when the scarf was flying, I think that it was a bird saying like, "Oh, you know that would be look like that would look very very nice in my nest, and my little <laughs> eggs need some warmth, so I'm gonna take that." And then it came and flew, and then he saw Mikasa was like a living thing, and she's like, "Oh shit, I'm out," and she's like, "Oh, that's Aaron, so you're still with me," and I'll mm -hmm. talk later about that. But it's like that's why I think Aaron's head is not necessarily under that tree. I think it's in Mikasa's closet somewhere. But yeah, it's oh, like yeah. I don't think I don't think it was Aaron Drinker. The theory meal is coming was... out. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. No, uh, I think I agree with a lot of the things you know that you said, Johan. Um, obviously, first and foremost, the usage of birds is kind of this vessel of sorts of almost storytelling in a sense. I know there's been kind of multiple viewpoints of one, you know, you have the the references to birds throughout the entire series and and them either being a connection to Aaron and, you know, as we kind of learn further on in the series in here, his ability to kind of see both present and past through his his Titan powers. Um, the other thing uh, for me in terms of like the bird at the end, um, I think honestly it was the device for uh, Isayama to throw into really create this kind of open-ended question for the fan base and kind of you know each individual taking their own kind of um representation or understanding of what it could mean um exactly as you said you know i'm sure there's gonna be those that really are kind of the diehard mikasa aaron fans that want them to still have that hope and really kind of feel for mikasa at the end here and you know i even think for mikasa herself as a character i know um, we'll probably talk about this later. It, it can be frustrating that Mikasa is really not able to move past Eren, you know, with kind of this entire series and her never really getting her fair shot. So I think partially, you know, that was her still having hope for himself of like, oh, man, like he's still here in some way. So I can kind of keep on going with knowing that. But um, I think otherwise, I personally wouldn't want to read too much into it, to your point, Johan, because then it really just starts to open the woodwork again of really... Kind of belittling Aaron's sacrifice if if it is the case that you know things are still kind of continuing past from what he had really had in mind of eliminating Titan presence and giving everybody this freedom that they've sought for so long. Um, yes, I I agree with with both of your points. Uh, for me, I took it as mostly symbolic. I didn't really read too deeply into it. It was kind of I, I felt like it was more just like a a. Um, panel manifestation of like what the series represents which ultimately mm -hmm. is for about freedom it does have the bird flying that is what Aaron cared about more than anything my only issue with it really was just you know thematically I was really th preparing for this podcast I was thinking a lot about the different themes of Attack on Titan and I think that overall um, despite your feelings on how this last chapter was executed I do think that all of those themes really came full circle except for this whole business with like how Mikasa supposedly freed Emir from her shackles of being in love with uh, King Fritz. And then, but meanwhile, Mikasa, she did admittedly do the right thing, I suppose, by killing Eren, and that's what freed Emir. But like, even though she did that for the world, she still mentally shackled herself. I mean, that's all right. we've seen of her from the get-go has, has been her devotion to Eren. And I think that, I mean, I just don't, it just doesn't like feel very good to me at the end. Like it, I wish, I just, 
I wished for more for her. And it just seems like a really bleak existence. Because, I mean, we see that all of the other characters have gone on. They're ambassadors of peace. They've got... Uh, there's Historia, who has a family now. I mean, there's... there's Everybody else has moved on, but there's Mikasa still. And I just think it's really sad. And I guess mm -hmm. maybe that was his intention, or I don't really know exactly what he wanted to say with that decision. But it was one thing that just felt off to me. No, I, I totally agree with that, where everybody's kind of getting their their just ends or kind of their their new start to the future, where it's explicitly for Mikasa, it really is kind of like, all right, you know, things haven't mm -hmm. really changed for you. Mm -hmm. You know, here you are still kind of clutching on to this, you know, individual or this um, kind of ideology of, you know, hope of that instance. And I think that it is something that there kind of has to be this point of like, all right, it, it's time to move on. You know, all things must come to an end, as unfortunate as it may be. Um, yep. well, but I feel like it, it could be something to do with Ackermans, too, because if you see Levi, like Levi is this really cool character and it's like obviously fan favorite or one of the fan favorites and it's like he was everything he did was basically surrounding the promise he made to erwin to you know mm -hmm. i will avenge you and your ideals are the best ones so i almost feel like ackermans like uh have this not implantation i forgot the word uh this um what did bella do with uh no with jake do with bella like oh, Twilight. imprint imprint <laughs> yeah imprint so it's like i feel like Ackerman's imprint in someone. And I feel so Levi's called out for knowing like... that, Johan. Hey, I'm just glad we had you here to, <laughs> to you know, call it out because that, that's a good reference. I get it. I mean, so. I knew I knew that you were gonna know it, so I just went with it. Like, eh, I'm pretty <laughs> sure Taylor's gonna help me. <laughs> we know our we know our cast here. <laughs> and then it was like uh, Levi was with Erwin, Mikasa was with you know with um, Aaron, and even probably what was this guy's name? Uh, Tony, not Tony. Um, Levi's master, not master, but sensei. Uh, Kenny, Kenny, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Kenny. oh, that guy. And Kenny was almost like with Levi, you know. So it's like, oh, you're super strong. You almost beat me. So, uh, like, once they are achieved, like once they are accomplished, they can't do anything else because it's like, okay, now my, you know, my goal is done, and you know, my master died. I'm just gonna hang around and, you know, remember him. Yeah, no, and I think that gives a lot of kind of credence to that final, you know, few scenes that we've seen with Levi of one, you know, giving the uh, the salute to all his fallen comrades as he sees as the, as the mist dissipates and, you know, a, a tear rolling down his eye, which no one ever thought we would see with Levi as much as we want him to, you know, show his heart on his sleeve. We do get it in that final moment, which I think is a very, you know, moment of what's I want, what's the word I want to use, like you know like finally you know we get to see this like thank you this is so fantastic to see but you know once you get past that feeling. yeah right you know um but the thing that i can't help but think about is you know after that scene the next time we see him is you know in his wheelchair being pushed by gabby and falco and it really is kind of at least from my perspective a, a sad reality of you know what what's left for him after that because you know you have to think like similar mm -hmm. to, to real life events where you know you have kind of this ongoing either PTSD or even with closure, it's like, what now? You know, his whole life has been fighting mm -hmm. Titans and, and all these things. It's like, that's something I'd even be really interested of, like a spinoff in some ways of like, where does his life go from there? And maybe that's just me being way too selfish, but it's, it's just things that I can't help but, but think about for these lovable cast of characters that we have here in this world. I that is where I turn to fix it fan fiction, where they give you ideas <laughs> of what could happen in the future. My favorite, is, my favorite is where Levi eventually goes on to work at one of, like an orphanage that Historia opens up, and he is the grumpy old whatever. Depends on what who the author is, but he's got different mm -hmm. roles around there, and doesn't sound like it works, but it does. Can't recommend it more. Fan Anything fiction. with cleaning Anybody is needs more. too, right? We know how much of a neat yes. freak Levi is. <laughs> yep. yep. Well, Leech um. Levi. While we're talking about like outstanding items, some mm -hmm. things that could have been explored more, um, Johan, why don't you go ahead and talk about your theory with Aaron's head and Mikasa? Mikasa. All right, I'm curious. <laughs> Here we go. So, <laughs> basically, ah, uh, yes, I have a full, like okay. So basically, you know how Mikasa as an Ackerman, she needs to know, like she needs to know for sure. She needs closure. She was the only one that always believed that Aaron was good. I mean, with Army. Mikasa probably more. Uh, she was like, 
Aaron's there and Aaron's my savior and Aaron's going to save humanity. And I believe we can change Aaron. Everything was about Aaron. Like she never, never, never stopped thinking about Aaron. So when she kills Aaron and she cuts her hair, the amount of determination that she had to have was final. You know, there wasn't a single like piece of doubt. She could not doubt at all that she had to kill Aaron. But I feel like she, like, remember her headaches? Her headaches, I think it was, like, when she was trying to remember something, like, her Ackerman blood was trying to remember, and she couldn't. There was, like, a problem in her head. Like, mm -hmm. it started hurting because she was not supposed to remember. Also knowing that Eren could manipulate people's minds, and, you know, it's like, oh, maybe if she's trying to fight against something Eren, like, something that Eren put in her head, it was like, you know, that was her body fighting against it. So she cuts her head, First thing she does, she grabs her head and kisses it because it's like, oh, you're not alive anymore, so you can't refuse this. So she kisses Eren's head, and it's like, okay, finally have you here. In every drawing that we see Mikasa, like, you know, grabbing Eren's head, she's not, like, grabbing it, she's holding it, and she's like, uh -huh. dearly. It's like she would never let anyone else grab Eren's head. Let's not remember that Mikasa is also the one that has seen Eren dying and coming back to life. Like, when, oh, shit! First episode, or I think third episode, Eren got eaten by a titan. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. Eren, you know, Eren is a titan itself. Mikasa was the one that saw her, and she was like, that titan looks kind of, you know, familiar. And it was Eren. Eren has been close to that many times, and then Mikasa saw him. So Eren is, is this being that not only became the most powerful being in Attack on Titan, he became the story itself. And then Mikasa always wanted her, like, she knew that he was way stronger but she always had this maternal fear feeling of, oh, you know, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to guard you. Uh, you know, you're going to be close to me. Clo like, being close to me is the only way that I can guarantee that you're fine. So when we go down to that tree, like she knew that Eren was in that tree, uh, in that tree and everything. And then Isayama has a lot of like attention to detail. Sometimes maybe he like forgets things, like maybe, you know, some fingers are wrong, but he has a lot of attention to detail. Now, when we see the rock right next to Mikasa and she's holding the rock, Mikasa is not holding the ground. Mikasa is not like, oh, you know, you're here. Or like, uh, there's not a special spot. There's nothing that shows that she picked something or anything. She's just like hanging out there, chilling, and she touches the rock. So that tells me, Mikasa loving Eren as much as she did, like probably the head was the only thing that she could keep because the rest of Eren's body was basically Titan made and it wasn't really his body. Mm -hmm. Because, like, when we see him inside the big, big, big head, it's like, okay, she took the head. I don't know what the hell happened, like, if that crystallized or disappeared, but whatever, like, she has his head. Now, the only way, when, like, and going to the bird, when she saw the bird, she thinks, like, is this Eren? Like, oh, thank you for taking care of me. If that happened to Mikasa, going into the PTSD that she probably has, it's like, what if this was Eren? Do I have to chase this bird? Does Eren want me to chase him down? I cannot live with that. I have to check if he's dead. So she goes back into her garage or into her closet and it's like <laughs> open. Oh no, Aaron's still dead. And she closes it. So Mikasa loved him so much that the only way that she can realize and she can guarantee that Aaron is still dead is by constantly realizing that Aaron is dead. That's why she never changed. Like, it's not like she doesn't change her clothes, but she always mm -hmm. has the scarf around her neck. She always keeps Aaron close. And Isayama made us make sure that we knew that Mikasa was completely obsessed over Eren. So why would she take the head and put it under the tree if she knew that, you know, she might know that it's there, but what would happen if someone went in there and knowing it was Eren, like our Eren fanatic or something, they pulled his head out. <laughs> The only Aaron real like, for future Wikipedia. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, basically. So the only reason that like the only way that she could be absolutely sure that Eren is not coming back is by, you know, keeping her prized possession of his head in her belongings. Well, Johan, I love <laughs> morbid plot lines. So the the part of me that loves morbid things absolutely loves that. And I definitely think that I definitely think that Mikasa has some pretty intense PTSD. Mm -hmm. Like, and so I can see why you would have these series or why people I've seen some, lots of people have not exactly the same, but like 
ongoing thoughts about what is going on with Mikasa, especially because of what I mentioned earlier, which is that like her her resolution is just kind of muddled, I think, as to what we were supposed to really take from it. Um, <laughs> I don't subscribe to that theory personally, but I like it. <laughs> hey, it's theories G like that that, uh, you know, really makes the fan base sink. And I, I know mm -hmm. as we'll talk about kind of other things here, there are a lot of great theories from, you know, the fan base of Attack on Titan that mm -hmm. when you really think about, you know, everything that was introduced and kind of touched upon, like those theories could have very well been canon. And in some instances, mm -hmm admittedly probably would have been a better way for for mm -hmm. things to develop um but no i i think again to tion's point and as we've kind of been saying for all these characters like the one re big remaining remnant is a lot of the ptsd that you know these characters are, are working through and dealing through and you know as you said taylor like just because of the things that that aaron did you know towards the end of the series here like yes it, it bought you know that quote-unquote freedom in time to really change the perception of the world but hey you know they're still building up their army they're still realizing that you know as much as you want to do from a diplomatic front there's always going to be those individuals that um your kind of um reasonings and things they fall on deaf ears and war is something that war never changes war is always mm -hmm. going to be there there's always going to be some sort of conflict so um i think that's another thing that that isayama has kind of also touched upon in that um even though there are happy things to take away it is still really a, a tragedy as well in kind of the scheme of things um and i think with mikasa directly her and aaron are probably the two most tragic characters through everything that they've done yeah only thing definitely. that she always kept the only thing that she always kept was her scarf you know she always had it with her and then like the last panel when she sees the like the bird and everything it's going, like, oh, see you later, Aaron. Like, you know, I I'm going to see you again. That could mean two things. One, when she dies, she's going to see Aaron. Or two, literally. Oh, yeah, I'll see you later. I have your head in my room. No problem. Let's chill. I mean, you yeah. Know? The <laughs> scarf is the world to her. It's the one mm -hmm. item that the person who kind of, quote unquote, gave her life, you know, Im imbued to mm -hmm. her. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like that, that totally, totally makes sense. Um, but again, man, it just really sucks that, um, you know, you want to have more for a character like mm -hmm. Mikasa. And it really is sad that kind of, as we said, you know, everybody is moving on in their own ways. And Mikasa, as, as you mentioned, Taylor, even after the three year flash forward to, you know, the, the new series of events, she's still just there probably going to Aaron's grave every day, sitting under that tree. Hopefully and... therapy is like a new thing that's coming to Paradise at this time. Like hopefully hopefully the rest of the world has therapy and they're yeah, as, long, as long as we don't have any more uh, Dr. Jaegers, just maybe they got a new line of uh, medical physicians oh, yeah. that won't kind of kick things off again. Um hopefully. <laughs> might be might be in better hands then. So I would so, hope for that as well. <laughs> Speaking of um some other outstanding things that I've seen a lot of people talking about with the ending. Historia's pregnancy and Historia's general importance to the story and at all things Historia. How do we feel about the reveal that she has a baby with a farmer? Exactly like what we were told many, many times, but just refused to accept, apparently. I mean, you know, those fan bases, when they have a relationship or a one true pair that they have in mind, when it doesn't come to a fruition... That's when the pitchforks come out. That's when the writing starts. And so um, you're referring to Aaron being like the dad, like the fan. Yeah, the there's okay. a lot of the theories of like Aaron and Historia being like, mm -hmm. oh, that's that's the true pair. Like they 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 should be the ones that are together at the end. Um, for me, in terms of getting back towards Historia's pregnancy, kind of not really going anywhere in terms of like, oh, we don't know. You know, now with this being kind of the new continuation of the Royal bloodline, like what is this child going to have in store for the attack on Titan series? And, you know, that not going anywhere. And then kind of directly to your point, Taylor, the father actually being this farm boy that she had met, you know, while on this farm and being kind of restricted from the world when she was younger. Um, I think it's, it, it's definitely unfortunate. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, I'm personally okay with it. I think it's something that really, again, was what she wanted at the end of the day. She wanted a normal life. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what she got. And deserved. After. Yeah. 
She really, I mean, she had a pretty shitty childhood, really. A lot of characters did, but hers was pretty tragic. So she really kind of deserved that if that's what she wanted. <laughs> um, I feel like her story as pregnancy was... Yeah, I feel like her pregnancy was like some way of, first of all, keeping her out of like battle. Because we know that with this big, big, big rambling happening and everything, Historia would want would have wanted to go. You know, it's like, oh, this is my people. This is the cause that we're fighting for. I'm the king or the queen. Like, you know, I'm the leader. I have to go help everyone. And then it was like the writers, like Isayama's way of understandably have uh, Historia outside of, you know, the conflict. And then... Um, Making the audience realize that you know, oh, you know, she's gonna be a mom. First of all, the probably the her family is gonna keep going. Like you know, the blood's gonna go and go. So it's gonna be like there's more to Historia mm -hmm. than just being this queen. When like you know, uh, for change, like being the the not the head, but like the matriarch of. Uh, of the people when everything like when the conflict finally ends when there's no more titans and she is the one she was the queen that made this possible they have to have her there they couldn't risk killing her because everyone that didn't die in the rumbling was either another titan or was a very 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 well trained and skilled fighter you know and historia she was pretty good but I don't think she was like Ackerman level, or, you know, oh, some of those guys not. that really, really freaking like kill three colossal titans and stay away. Like Hanji died. And if she dies, Historia would have been definitely in the ground somewhere there. So I feel like it was a way of saying, you know, um, fighters are fighters, warriors are warriors, and, you know, leaders are leaders. Like everyone that fought there was in the military. Everyone that wasn't military sadly died. So it was like, you know, we need to keep royalty safe. And the best way of doing that is by having her pregnant because she has to, you know, take care of her family. And mm -hmm. the dad being the farmer, I feel like it's a way of showing, you know, royalty is just another one of us. It's royalty just because of money or connections. But, you know, it's like a farmer was the dad. And that means that the baby is not overpowered because if Aaron turned out to be the dad, it would be like, oh, is there any freaking, you know founding little titan powers in him or whatever and it would Definitely. be like no he's just a regular kid you know from a farmer let's go history yeah i mean think of anything we've seen you know from zeke nothing really good comes of being of royal blood <laughs> i mean obviously there's a whole different ball game with what being of royal blood meant for the series before kind of this new world that aaron ushered us into um mm -hmm. but no i i totally agree with uh with your thoughts there johan so I think that that I sets like... a good precedent too against like any potential as they're basically rebuilding their country. I think it sets sets a really good precedent against classism too, which wasn't something mm. that was really like it wasn't a hot topic in Attack on Titan, but there were mentions of yeah, it was always there favorite. in the background. Yeah, it was very. It, he definitely had it in the background as a thing that was going on, and it sets a precedent against that. Something that you know, we're all people, we're all survivors who came out on the other side of this what's left of us so i just think it's i think i love actually the fact that she did end up with the farmer i'm 100 percent okay with it i think that my biggest issue is just how it was written in i feel like he I, I don't know if he meant to to make it seem like such a red herring but like half of my brain was really focused on thinking that on on some level that was going to come into play in a big important way and i didn't really care if Aaron was the dad, I didn't really care who was the dad. I didn't think it was going to be Aaron. I really didn't have any theories. I just wanted, I just thought something bigger was going to come from it because it kept getting mentioned and then it just wasn't. And I just found it kind of distracting from everything else going on at the end of the day. Makes, makes sense. sense. No, definitely, definitely does. Uh, let's see. Do I have anything else in the outstanding items? I don't think so. Oh, one thing I was going to say, too, I, while I was doing some research for this video, um, for anybody that's ever been on Reddit under the Titan folk subreddit for um, Attack on Titan, there's actually a poll that somebody, one of the mods posted and pinned to the top. Um, it had like 15, almost 16,000 responses, so quite a bit. Um, just kind of gathering people's ideas of um, like their, how they felt at the end of the chapter and things like that. And one of the responses had asked, which of the debunked theories are you most disappointed didn't happen? And Historia's was actually, his, 
they've specifically phrased it as Historia being important <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is the item. And that was what most people voted on. So it seemed like a lot of people were kind of expecting that to have some importance and it just never did. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'll That's reference that poll here and there. And anybody should definitely check it out. It's really interesting. Let's see. So at least to like, if anyone is ever, like if I'm ever by any reason getting an Attack on Titan tattoo, like by whatever reason or circumstance, it's going to be Levi falling down during the side with the tear. <laughs> That's like by far probably my favorite little piece of manga anime I will ever see from Attack on Titan. Yeah, and directly from, you know, the, the poll that Taylor mentioned, that was one that mm -hmm. really resonated with uh, a lot of the fan base that participated in this poll by a, a staggering amount at 71% against the yep. slew of, of other options that they have listed here. Exactly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, just kind of diving into it now, we talked about some of the stuff that wasn't really answered or didn't get expounded upon too much, but what mm -hmm. were... What were your overall thoughts? Like, especially when you first finished reading the chapter? Um, I guess for me, it was that initial kind of, I don't want to call it emptiness, but it almost was emptiness in mm -hmm. a sense where, you know, again, as we said at the beginning of the podcast here, it's been 12 years um, that the series has been going on. And, you know, all this time spent in watching the anime, reading the manga, waiting for the new releases, going, you know, to your, you know, various friend groups, talking about theories, going on Reddit and all these places and to have it finally all come to a head. And then you reach that final page and, you know, you, you, you either click your mouse or you click your arrow key to go to the next page and there's nothing. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. this, this is it. And for me, um, I don't think at the time when I originally finished reading the final chapter, um, I really had kind of the most succinct thoughts of what I thought about the series as a whole. I think now, you know, a couple weeks past the fact, um, I think I'm still satisfied. Um, I think there's obviously things that I could look back on and go through the entire series and kind of, you know, pick at, at the end of the day. But for me, it's something that I don't really see kind of too much value there because we've seen from Isayama, like this is a story that he's had in his mind for the longest time and that he's shown us, you know, through various parts of the series that we can trust him. And I think even with, you know, the mixed review at the end, I'm still very satisfied with what he did. He gave us a, a great world, a great cast of characters. And the fact that there is such a, you know, heated debate even ongoing, that just shows how much love there is, regardless of what happened at the end of the day. But overall, satisfied, I'd say, for the final chapter in my own regard. Anywhere from probably like a seven and a half, would probably be um, where I would place it. Um, and the only reason for that is I feel like, you know, as we've talked about, there was a lot of loose ends that really kind of didn't. Just oh. to clarify, you'd rate, rate the last chapter as that or the overall yeah. series? Okay, okay. Last sorry. chapter. Sorry. No, no, no. Very good clarification. I don't want anybody thinking, you know, oh, here's the hard ass over here being really strict. I'd love to see what your other anime ratings are. No, <laughs> thank you, Taylor. Last chapter uh, as a seven and a half. Um, and only reason for that is, again, I feel like there's some things that, were there weren't enough closure for um and without going too far into detail i'd say yelena is one of them and oh, annie is another character that i feel like you know yes she had all these kind of endearing moments with armin in the end and now they're kind of shipped as a couple but if you think about the things that annie did like she was the sole reason that a lot of uh, levi's teammates are dead and it feels like you know they just kind of all, all push it as water under the bridge and again it's just something that i can't help but think about but like there has to still be that animosity where it's like, hey, like, I know we're cool now and I know, you know, we're trying to put things beside us, but you pretty much wiped out a lot of, you know, my teammates, apart from Zeke as well. <laughs> yeah, they he, really he got his to, just ends. <laughs> they really kind of tried to play that off, I feel like, in the campfire scene um, before the Jaegerist attack at the, like, the dock, mm. you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I feel no, like exactly. Campfire, they were kind of coming like bridging their differences and like wow you you did a really shitty thing you 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 killed all these people you lied like they, they kind of addressed those things and then said well we've all been shitty and that's true and that is a, a very healthy way to look at it for sure is to just be like we've all made mistakes and you know done things that we regret but that you know keeping this animosity or acting upon it for the future won't benefit anybody that's all well and good but you're totally right justin in the sense that like things can't just 
at least internally, people are still going to hold those animosities. And that really was never quite addressed in that last chapter amongst like our core group. You know, mm-hmm. they're all just buddy, buddy, peace ambassadors. Yeah. And then last thing I, I know I've been kind of uh, going on and on here, but the only other thing I wasn't really a fan of was the fact that everybody kind of got off scot free in terms of those that turned into Titans, you know, Connie, Aaron, Gabby, all of them. Oh. Um, I think it's something that's very convenient and very, you know, almost shonen esque, where mm-hmm. for a series like Attack on Titan, especially, you know, those final moments of, or what we thought were the final moments of Connie and Jean, you know, kind of jesting with one another of the adventures and, and ride that they've had. For that then to just completely be brought back, it's like, hey, we're all good now. Like, that was a little bit disappointing. So that was another reason of why I would say the final chapter was like a seven and a half for me. That's totally fair. <laughs> so, I would agree with that. In that's the me end. just being a a, a a lover of tragic series and especially authors who aren't afraid to, you know, get rid of main kind of characters. So it's kind of odd to, to see that from Isayama. I thought it was shocking. Like I, 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 one hundred percent. I thought we were going to go into this and losing everybody, or at least most people. I, I really thought it was going to be. He didn't even said multiple times that he wanted to break people's hearts or something like that. I can't remember exactly how it was phrased. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's, yeah. That, that, that's my thoughts. Um. Yeah. Interested to hear what, what did you guys think of uh, the final chapter? Yeah, Johan, go ahead. What What was your feeling when you finished? I liked it. I mean, I we kind of knew how it was going to end because it wasn't like if it went all crazy shit and, you know, oh, Eren is the new Dark Lord of everything and everyone gets fucked, it would be like impressive and it would be like, OK, but for Attack on Titan being such a thing and, you know, the anime is going to like end it. I, I was happy to see like, you know, and I know we all compare it to Code Geass and it's going to if it worked in Code Geass, it would probably work in Attack on Titan, you know? Having this big main enemy and then that enemy dying for everyone, but turns out that mm-hmm. he was good. I liked it. I mean, I roll with it. And every time that it happens, which I feel it's going to start happening more often, I don't like that, but you know, it works. Um, one of the things that I kind of didn't like about the end, and not didn't like what I would have liked more, it was only a 50 page chapter. I wouldn't mind if it was like a hundred, because mm-hmm. even though there weren't many, many, many things that needed closure there's some important things that i feel needed closure uh we're gonna talk about later about the like aaron's warhammer abilities but one Mm -hmm. of the things that i wanted to see is like okay you know there's this big ass rumbling all of the titans are walking they're destroying everything it's a huge amount of colossal titans and then everything stops because Aaron dies okay i get that i would have loved to see like you know people going like what happened like out of nowhere these huge colossal titans just become like people going like, what did I just do? Like, you know, were they people? Was there any like, actual people? Or, you know, what happened to those Titans? Like, yeah, that's a good point. Were they just bones or just a zoom mm-hmm. out of that world that we could visualize apart from just leaving that to imagination? That's a fantastic yeah. point that you bring up. That's a great point, yeah. And then I would have loved to see, because I feel that's one of the things that I've read the most. Everyone is assuming that the warm thingy is dead because they were kicking the shit out of it. But that thing was alive since the dinosaurs, you know, it was there. And it's like seeing that thing like disappearing or someone slashing it and then just going, make, like becoming goo or something, that would have been nice because that would mean, okay, it's finally over. If the conflicts are over, why the hell are the Jaguarists building a big ass army? You know, it's like there's no Titans anymore. We're in peace. Why do you need so many weapons? You know, it's like, are you planning an invasion? Are you going to be the new, like, you know, is this what you think Aaron wanted? But he got, because I'm sure that people are going to think, like, the diehard Yagris are going to be, like, you know, like, the people that Aaron didn't talk to, like, not his friends or the other Titan shifters, it's going to be, like, you know, they stopped Aaron. Aaron lost. So we have to accomplish what Aaron wanted. And it's going to be, like, no, chill. This is what Aaron wanted. Relax. Mm-hmm. Ask me, because ask Lee. Yeah, I mean, that's to your point. You know, how do these devote Jaegerists believe that when it's not mm-hmm. coming from Aaron's mouth directly? Exactly. That's true. Uh, I actually didn't think about that at all. That's a really great point too, because there were quite a few of them. And mm-hmm. as as you know, news of this spreads, or I don't, as the world, I guess, recovers from this, you know, you'd think that his motivations and his story would, 
you know, by word of mouth and through telephone, everybody's going to hear different things and have their different ideas. There might even be new Jaegerists that come around post the fact that that, yeah, anyways. Yeah, like, Yoren lost. What, he lost? No, he didn't. And it's like, he didn't, but he did. Yeah, because really, it was just, I wonder how much, like, Aaron, or, um, sorry, Armin and Mikasa shared. I, I think they basically shared all of it. Everything that Aaron had talked about with them privately, I think they probably mm -hmm. told like all of their close friends and anybody else in the 104th division yeah, and, because, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. One thing that I like but, is that they made sure that they showed us that Aaron did talk to everyone and he explained mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, you're going to forget this, but this one's going to happen. So chill. Mm -hmm. When I die, you're going to remember this. But yep. he only he only could only talk to certain amount, amount of people. You know, it's like mm -hmm. he didn't talk to everyone. I love how that was shown too. Like that's one mm -hmm. of the things I loved the most about this series was when after his talk with um with Armin and you see that that happened right before Armin was going to talk to Annie when they were still on the ship. I thought that was because I remember reading that and thinking, what happened here? So, like <laughs> Armin's looking up at the sky, he sees a bird, something happened here, but I can't figure out what I'm missing. And so to have that shown just felt so it just felt so fulfilling. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and it made me happy too, because like I, I was kind of I'm such a Aaron fan. I love I've loved Aaron from day one. I've defended him from day one. I just loved Aaron. And it really hurt to see him treating his friends this way, you know, Aaron and Mikasa, especially, obviously. Um, especially like after that scene that you read later on in the manga series, too, of when they when the whole group was working together on like rebuilding like the railroad that goes to the dock. And Aaron, they're talking about who's going to inherit the attack titan. And Aaron is so fond of everybody. They all cry and blush at the same time. And then it switches, of course, to Aaron, dire Aaron, sad Aaron, emo Aaron, and all of his plans. So it was really nice for me to be able to see that he had been thinking about his friends this whole time, that it was wearing on him, that he's still like the Aaron that I knew and loved and had made time to have these conversations with um, Armin and Mikasa. Sorry, I just love that moment. <laughs> no, not at all. Painting a, a fantastic picture there. So, <laughs> but yeah, final chapter. Sorry, Johan, did you have any other thoughts that you wanted to share after per after finishing reading it? Uh, not really. I mean, as Joey said, like it was such a long manga, and it was full of up and downs. And like mm -hmm. in the beginnings, like you think nothing else can go wrong. Well, just hold on a second. You know, it was like everything was going wrong, and then I feel like Aaron. Uh, which I'll talk about later, but the final chapter showed us that Eren really, really wasn't ever free at all, whatsoever, even in the end. Mm -hmm. you know, He yeah. was the epitome, the center mm -hmm. of the problem. So when he realized that, there's one quote that I want to say that I wrote down, uh, Eren, Eren 131, episode 131, he said, when I learned that people lived outside the walls, I was disappointed. I think it was like in that moment when he realized that, uh, you know, I'm never going to be free. I'm mm -hmm. the center of all this shit and I'm okay with it. I'm the only one mm -hmm. that can make a change. But yeah, that's, I, I would give the final chapter probably an eight because it closed a lot of things and it didn't make me angry and I get angry very easily. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, it's a masterpiece, Attack on Titan. It's like, it's a weird masterpiece, but it's a great seinen, I would say. It's really good. I think I would agree with you on the scoring. I think I would actually give it an eight too. I mean, I'm coming off of series like some of my favorite series in my life have been Lost, which has a notoriously <laughs> controversial ending. Um, I loved Harry Potter, which I thought was great throughout, but the epilogue in Harry Potter had a lot of contention. So, I mean, I've come off some series that were great that had pretty terrible endings. And I was a little bit like the chapters leading up to this final chapter had me really worried that things weren't going to be answered, that I wasn't going to feel happy with Aaron's um, arc and where it ends but actually in the end I, I'm happy with it my first thoughts upon reading it were I felt like Justin felt a little bit empty <laughs> um, I felt I, for some reason I felt like some things hadn't been answered uh, but I think really what it was was it was just such a huge series coming to an end I think it's just the natural reaction of like wanting more already missing the characters um, and so the things I was confused about, for example, I remember I messaged Justin right away about um, the mention that it was Mikasa that had changed Emir's mind um, and really affected Emir's actions going forward. And I remember messaging Justin and saying, what? <laughs> how did that happen? When, where, where, how, like what, how? And it gets dropped and then isn't mentioned again. And I was like, what, what, what does that even mean? So like as 
fans got online after the release of this and started theorizing and I started hearing theories about why that was. It all kind of came together and at the end I was happy and I would I would give it an 8. It really two points just docked because of questionable dialogue um and kind of just being a, a little bit messy there at the end. Just just a messy chapter in general in my opinion. Yeah. Um but like speaking about Aaron like how you had brought up Johan you had mentioned that Aaron, out of all the characters in the series, was basically the one that really never was free ever, which I totally agree with. And I think it's just so tragic. Every time I think about it, it actually just makes me so sad because he's like my, one of my favorites. How, how does everybody feel about Aaron? Do you feel like it was a believable transition, how he ended up where he did? Man, I think it's kind of tough for me to think about like, when did Aaron really lose kind of control of himself in a sense where um, I think Johan put it a good way where, you know, we're talking about how he funnily enough, never really had freedom and, and was kind of the, the slave in this story to um, w what we can at least say at this time, the plot of Ymir. And I think to your point, Taylor, that is something that we never really got much kind of full insight into apart from you know like her relationship with king fritz and you know using of her abilities and and being you know kind of consumed by the royal family um and and more so towards mikasa being the one that really kind of frees ymir herself i think that's something that um you know again it was a lot of theory crafting and in work of you know very dedicated individuals of the series to kind of put together those missing pieces or links um but for Aaron, um, I would say once he became a Titan, funnily enough, is really when when things kind of changed. I know in, in a sense, it's like, hey, you know, kind of in the Shonen trope uh, mindset of, oh, I have this new ability. This is going to, you know, help me kind of become one on one with other Titans that I'm now fighting against in this world and kind of give humanity a, a better chance of success. I think it was at that point with everything that we know now what when his father transformed him that was gg that was you know the yeah. start of like okay this aaron is is no more in, in what he believed in um and so that's even something funnily enough that when we first see him you know through season one season two and until all the way into season three of the anime we don't learn how aaron actually became a titan so it really is kind of that that shocking reveal of like from a young age and from when we first see him episode one he's already not free at that mm -hmm. point, or at least a few episodes or whatever, so. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty tragic. And at the end, I feel like this is a theory, but I don't think it's a theory. I think it's, like, pretty obvious. So, before Aaron dies, you see Ymir everywhere, you know? You saw this little kid just looking at everything, like, oh, the people are dying from the rumbling. She's looking at them. Oh, the Titan shifters are playing with the Titan shifters on top of freaking dinosaur Eren. <laughs> Yamir is looking at it, you know. When Mikasa cuts Eren's head and she's like, oh, but Yamir is there. And she was connected with Eren in the realm. So I think this was one way of the author expressing that Eren, through Ymir, was looking at everything from different perspectives, everything that was happening, the murdering of people, the fighting between his friends and the past, you know, Titan shifters. And he became, you know, like, he went like, oh, you know, everything is going according to what I thought it was going to be. Like, because I, I think, I feel like if Aaron's plan was compromised at any point, he would, he would have just been like, okay, give me one second. I'm going to fix this and then I'll die. You know, if something wasn't going according to his plan. So when he realized that everything was going up, he went like, okay, I can't be free. But that doesn't mean that everyone else can't be free. So my sacrifice is going to be what makes everyone, like, you know, uh, closer to each other. Like, that's fine. I'm good with it. I, like, I'm okay with that, that I have to die in order for everyone else to get their freedom. And that's okay. Aaron's character development. At the beginning, I thought they just made him a psychopath. But now that I look back, I go like, you know, that's one way to make a character evolve, you know, but by making him the villain. And the very famous phrase, like, you either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. That's Eren, you know? He died a hero, but lived as a villain, being a hero. But only mm -hmm. he knew. Like, he wasn't selfish at all. He, like, 
he was the epitome of what every shonen character wants to be. He saved everyone by, you know, dying and taking the power with him. So, yeah. Oh, I will say this. I do pretty much agree with you, but I've been tossing around this idea in my head of, like, I, I was sitting here thinking Aaron really is pretty selfless. Like, he did this for to, to, to give people freedom, or at least the, the closest that he could give them, which was... You've got like a kind of a blank slate across the world. Lots of people have died. Um, you've been given time and the ability to catch up with the um, for Paradis to catch up with the rest of the world. The Titans are gone. So like biologically, everybody's on the same playing field. So he really set that up as much as he possibly could, given the, the situation. However, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe he's actually not that selfless because like he even said in that carriage ride that I mentioned earlier when they were like building the train that he loved his friends and the people in Paradise more than anybody and he wanted to help them. So I think it was the best possible outcome for those people, but the world at large, <laughs> I don't know that that's like the case. Like I think he was very selfless yeah. towards the people he'd grown up around, but it was, he was, I feel like still definitely the villain just objectively for the rest mm -hmm. of the world. I don't know. Do you guys agree yeah. with that or what are your thoughts? No, I, I think that's definitely fair. And I think it kind of brings up the question further now of like, did Aaron really, you know, bring everybody to the best conclusion that he could? Mm -hmm. I know that's something that if you try to show that in a series, it could become very muddled oh. because then you have to have yeah. all these kind of like inner chapters of, you know, Aaron's experience and like him kind of logically trying to think through like, OK, I could mm -hmm. do this and maybe it doesn't work. And I think that was something that if I had to kind of give another critique to kind of the series as a whole i i really wasn't a fan when they utilized the attack titan as this titan that just kind of supersedes almost time and space in its sense you know where he's just kind of interconnected everywhere and can do you know every little tweak to every little thing because i think when you introduce that and like that time travel type aspect mm -hmm. that becomes a really hard tool to keep under control Mm -hmm. And it's something that just, again, opens up the woodworks for, was this the best solution? Did Aaron really, you know, do what was best? Exactly like you said, Taylor, like, yeah, he explained what he did, what was best. But, you know, we're not getting the perspectives of everyone else. Like, this is a very narrow mindset. Yeah, it's like, seeing. if people, what makes you think that, you know, for the entire series, they were like, why do you treat Elgin so shitty? Because they are devils. Because they are the island devils. They, for hundreds and thousands of years, they made people miserable. So now it's our turn. And then what tells you that they're not going to do now the same? It's like, oh, for hundreds of years, you told us like we were the, you know, the devils of the island, that we were shit. Well, now we're going to get some payback. And then yeah. the people from the rest of the world are going to be like, oh, well, remember what you did thousands of years ago? You just did it again. By killing freaking 80% of the population. So no, you're wrong. So, you know, it's that conflict that it's just gonna keep going bouncing from one side to the other one and it's yeah. like the I slate like... is never truly clean <laughs> exactly <laughs> and it's like when i saw that picture of like uh paradise instead of making like you know being chilled and everything no we have a new army the jagger army it's like okay so you're just gonna keep going without titans yeah that seems like human nature pretty much yeah i think that's kind of why i was I accepted Isa Isayama just saying that Aaron had gone through the mental gym, uh, like gymnastics of determining if this was the best route. I'm just going to accept it because, honestly, it hurts my head too much to go. It's a, to... it's a bad rabbit hole to get down. <laughs> it's a, it's a there, bad there's hole. no answer, really. You could think of anything. <laughs> I'm going to quote Captain Janeway from Star Trek here and say, I hate time travel, so I don't want to go <laughs> down that. that. Personally, I don't want to go down that wormhole too much. and. Morally speaking, from Aaron's perspective, I'd said that I, you know, I, I feel that objectively he's a villain really for the rest of the world. Um, but I'm okay with it. Like, I'm really okay with the decision that he made because at the end of the day, I'm going to, I'm going to give props to one of our other collaborators, Sasha, who has been pro, who has been pro Aaron this whole time. He'll support whatever Aaron does. And he really just cares about the characters we've been with this whole time. I agree with Sasha. The people that I know and love are taken care of. And I mean, the rest of the world made it really, really, really difficult to negotiate. They never gave them a shot. They reacted the way that they felt that they could. Both Aaron, with his um, omniscient knowledge and extreme power, and everybody else accordingly as well. It, 
they did what they had to do, really. So I was okay with it all in the end. <laughs> Morally speaking, so I don't know what that says about me. That that was one thing. Um, looking at the poll again, too, there's a question that says, which was, or, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, uh, I had it here. It was basically something about where, like, are you happy with what happened with the ambassadors for peace and how everything ended up with still a lot of political turmoil? And the responses were like across the board, like people were really kind of everybody had different op opinions on it. And I think that's a good thing, actually, because. Like, that's life. There's never really any completely correct answers, you know, and at the end of the day, humans are always going to find a reason to fight. So I think that Aaron just put them in the best position possible. And I'll accept that that's the truth, because what else can you do? Sorry, that was kind of rambling. No. I, I agree. I think it is something that this series, apart from, you know, freedom and everything, it is a introspective into human nature, kind of to that point. It's it's a series that there never is a definitive moral standpoint. Everything at the end of the day is a gray area. And I, I can't help but think that that, again, is a great testament to Isayama and him really painting that perspective of what the real world is like. As much as we want to, you know, sing around the campfire and sing Kumbaya with everyone like that's just unfortunately not not gonna happen so it's like a lot of people compare attack on thailand with world war ii and i can see why everything from the weapons to the ideology it's gonna be like at the end of the day if there was someone resembling adolf hitler it would be Aaron. and then the people that are close to him are gonna be like he did things for the good reason and then most of the world are gonna be like no he killed a bunch of people and then he got defeated you know, it's like, it's all perspective. Of course, you know, Eren is not Hitler. Eren did have a plan. His means to get it, like, you know, to, to get his plan done, questionable for sure. But at the end of the day, he, he thought that, like, he had the power to do something and he did it. Instead of just going like, oh no. It's like when a villain captures the main character and he doesn't kill him right away, Eren just did. Eren went like, okay, here's my power. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to do something big. And then I let everyone realize mm -hmm. why I did it. So no. I, I wanted oh, no, to, I'm uh, sorry, if Justin, I, you had I, no, 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 I didn't have anything. I was just <laughs> kudos to Johan's point of that direct connection to, you know, the humanity's history in the mm -hmm. real world. So, yeah, absolutely. I was just going to kind of see if you guys had if you two had anything that you wanted to bring up about this last chapter, I'm kind of looking at the time here. I want to be able to get into some more free talk stuff. What was our favorite? Yeah. What were our favorite moments? Our least favorite moments? Just some more casual chatting. So, what okay. what do you guys want to get out about the last chapter? So if I only have one one last thing that I, I didn't touch upon, and I know um, Johan kind of uh, mentioned it briefly in one of the other mm -hmm. answers to his question was uh, in this final chapter specifically. Um, one thing that uh, I forgot to mention was the lack of explanation and or usage of the warhammer titan abilities oh, yeah. or even just further abilities in general that aaron kind of has at this point um mm -hmm. so just talking specifically about the warhammer titan i feel like in both the manga and now recently you know with this last part of the anime series um there is a lot of direct focus on aaron's consumption of mm -hmm. um god i'm gonna forget her name is it lyra uh that sure, is yes. the warhammer titan sure let's go with that I, I may be wrong um <laughs> but you know they they zoom in directly on aaron's eye as he's consuming mm -hmm. you know the the marrow or, or spinal fluid of the warhammer titan holder and I, I couldn't help but feel you know they explain the whole background of how they're able to you know form all these different type of weapons and yeah then maybe that's something that they could have tied into uh the the final chapter here as like another device to fend off uh armin and, and crew from that final battle but i think the thing for me that i really kind of appreciated from uh the fan groups and in, in theories was that um one of the warhammer titans abilities is the ability to move their body to a safer location from the direct body of the titan itself so i thought to myself like wow that would have been a perfect ability to use in this final battle where you know all eyes are on this gigantic monster the biggest titan that we've seen to date in the series and you know just because they think oh we killed the body i would have really enjoyed it it's like oh nope aaron's body is like somewhere else and, you know they just pan off to this other location and then aaron emerges you know or he's he's in his crystal form like annie and, and others have taken so that was one thing from a fan theory aspect i was really sad that didn't come to play and i think from a writing perspective for isayama 
it just made it weaker as well. Like they really called him out of like, what was the purpose of this? You mm-hmm. know, is or Aaron even just t- yeah talking about the Tibber family because they brought up the Warhammer stuff at exactly the same time that they introduced the Tibber family, and it was like they really went into that family. Definitely right. <laughs> it felt like they were gonna be important, <laughs> and they really weren't. So. It was very odd. It felt like he had an idea of where he wanted to go with that. And then he, he didn't like it and he just scrapped it and then just said, hopefully everybody will forget. Yeah, that's right. Really and that's was... the one thing we've realized. Attack on Titan fans, we don't forget anything. Mm-hmm. So uh, on that thing, one thing that because I was thinking, I was like, you know, why didn't he use the Warhammer Titan? Like what? Like I was going around and around. And the only thing I can possibly think that Aaron used the Warhammer Titan was he was so powerful. He used the Warhammer Titan instead of having his capsule, which I, I don't understand why. Maybe he needed to be there in case something like they killed his body and then he became the Colossal Titan to fight with Armin. But the only thing of usage of the Warhammer Titan that I think he was using was going back to when I say all of those Titans. The only reason I can imagine is Ayama not making everyone like back to him and Forrest and realizing what was I doing? Like I was doing the rumbling was mm-hmm. either A, all of those Colossal Titans were actually the power of the Warhammer Titan, so Eren was actually making all of them. Mm-hmm. Or and the when they were fighting on his back, all of the Titans were attached to his body. And when they killed, like, when, you know, they saw the Beast Titan and they were like, oh, they're sick. And they killed it. It turns out that it was a decoy. Like, you know, Sig wasn't in there. Sig was like somewhere else in Eren's body, but not the one they destroyed. Mm-hmm. I feel like Eren was using, using the Warhammer Titan to make all of the other Titans. Like, you know, because they were attached to him and you could see like they were all having like cables to the main Eren body. Maybe, but then it would be a power of a Warhammer that only Aaron had, and that's suspicious yeah. because it's like, yeah, is that MC plot, like MC armor? Like, just Aaron can do this. <laughs> he can do biological things right. connected to him. He kind of becomes yeah. like uh, Thanos from Avengers, collecting, like, the different power stones, mm-hmm. and now he can just, you know, manipulate all these different things. So, yeah. no, I, I think that's very true. I think mm-hmm. that's a fair theory. I, I'll be honest. Uh, the entire logistics of those last few chapters where there's just titans coming out of the woodwork... Mm-hmm. I didn't look into that too deeply. I was not a big fan of Same. that, bringing them all back. I just thought it was messy. I thought it literally just made the manga look messier and harder to follow on top of plot-wise being unnecessary. I just, I didn't like anything about it. If I We actually have a list of things that we dislike, and I did not put that on my list, but I'm going to add that here right now. I, I thought <laughs> that was... <laughs> Poorly executed. But Johan, if you're trying to come up with ideas of how he maybe could have or maybe did somehow use Warhammer, I think it works. I mean, yeah, I, I like think it, it makes a lot. Just as much sense as anything else Isayama did with that section. Mm-hmm. Basically. Um Yeah, that that was that was an odd choice. Because even Justin, you mentioned too that like outside of even just the Warhammer or the Tibber family specifically being kind of oddly placed and oddly focused on just the consumption of other Titans, uh, spinal fluid should like seem like it would have more of an effect on Aaron and his abilities and whatnot, but it just yeah. never really. I mean, think about too, where Aaron was really harping against Armin for consuming Bertholdt and, you know, mm-hmm. kind of in that pivotal scene where Aaron, you know, arrives in the uh, the restaurant and, you know, he confronts mm-hmm. Gabby, Mikasa, Armin, and he really is continuing to play mind games with Armin specifically of saying, hey, you know, I know you've kind of taken an interest in Annie, but are those mm-hmm. thoughts even really yours? Are you sure, you know, you're just not being influenced further by Bertolt and his memories? And I, I think, if anything, now thinking about with Aaron's kind of prerogative of consuming these... Uh, these special titans it just makes it weaker as well because it's like well how come aaron's not impacted by you know the memories of of these others i know they kind of Mm. mentioned it with like him having ptsd from like the memories of his father of you know eating his father and then of the owl you know and and his kind of struggles and everything but i don't know again it's something that there just wasn't enough explanation for me behind it and the only thing that i guess i could think about in this moment is that oh maybe aaron was originally on this mission to consume these other special titans so that he could take all these powers away from everybody else and kind of seal them off from the world that's what i like so that's that's one thing that i thought it was brilliantly put on so Eren was the founding titan Eren had all these powers and i feel like Eren could 
easily, like if he didn't want anyone to, you know, mess with his plans, he would like, I don't know, Annie or uh, uh, Dinah or Rainer would be like, okay, I don't want you to turn into a Titan. I will seize your ability of turning into a Titan because I can, and then you cannot like, you know, uh, mess with my plans. But the fact that Eren didn't do that, the fact that Eren allowed everyone to fight with him, I think it was like a way of saying, you know, Eren had this plan very, very thought about, like it was very, it worked. And he wanted the last fight to be with the Colossal Titan, like 1v1 against Armin. Otherwise he would just just be like, oh, okay, you know, you destroyed my big ass dinosaur form. Here's another big ass dinosaur form. It's like, no, one on one, Colossal Titan, let's go. Uh, That makes a lot of sense. Cause then now I can't help but think back to the end of season two, when Aaron first kind of taps into the usage of the founding Titan, when he punches, Mm -hmm. you know, Dina's hand and, Mm -hmm. and tells them to get away from him. And that, you know, causes like the chain reaction of the lesser Titans all obeying his orders. But then Mm -hmm. even for Reiner and Berthold, them still having kind of that, um, I guess like shock, but still being in control. So it is mm-hmm. something of like, oh, as Aaron progressed and got more quote unquote adept with his knowledge of these powers to directly your point, Johan, like he definitely could have just been like, hey, don't do this or hey, I won't let you do that. And um, again, it really just shows that Aaron was the the mastermind at the end of the mm-hmm. day here of, of making things fall into place where they needed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Johan, did you have any other final topics that you wanted to bring up, like specifically about this last chapter before we get into more of kind of just a free chat? No, I think that's it. I think I I, I made very clear that I I liked it. A lot of theories around my head going on. Well, we'll we'll, we'll have a chance to get into some of those. Like anybody who's read it or who loves Attack on Titan knows, like as you're talking, these thoughts will come into your head where you're like, wait, I didn't think of it that way. Wait, does this mean something else? Like, oh my gosh. So we'll just, we'll talk. Let's segue for a brief moment. Let's talk about what our, should we talk about our three least favorite things from the series overall or three favorite things? I put it as least to talk about first so we could go into the good things. Mm -hmm. Um... I can let you talk about yours, Taylor, because honestly, for me, I would say a lot of my least favorite things came as a result of the final arc or chapters. And mm-hmm. more specifically, I, I found myself out of everything being the most critical of this final final few chapters. So in terms of like a series perspective, going back, maybe it it's just me being ignorant. But yeah, there's not much that mm-hmm. I, I don't even know if I want to go back and try to pick it apart at that point. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I feel like it might diminish the series and what i remembered in my mind so i would just like to leave it as it is and that's kind of where i'm at i'm not so different from you honestly i really had to like think about it and the stuff that i have is still just kind of nitpicky like i wish it could have been a different way but it's it's it, it, it's definitely not anything i would detract points over you know what i mean mm-hmm for things that kind of stuck with me is grading throughout the series for me i was actually really invested in emir like um historia's emir <laughs> i was really invested in her, her as a character and i think that was maybe just a personal thing because i never really see anybody else talk about her too much but i felt like they did spend a decent amount of time building up her backstory building up her relationship with um krista at the time her, she was still krista historia, and, yep um i i just felt like th- then even with her titan reveal and how she fought to protect all of the cadets that were there with her. And then eventually the later on conversations that she had with Reiner and Bertolt as they were, as their plans were going up in a steaming pile and they tried to kidnap <laughs> Aaron. I just felt like there was so, so much that she influenced there. Like she really became, I felt like a critical character only to then just die off screen with hardly a mention, you know, it just, yeah, it to, was to, to Porco of all people as well. <laughs> I know how much we, we loved Porco and his, uh, <laughs> Oh, is his undercut, you know, haircut. <laughs> and I'm not I know that there's probably people out there that are like splitting hairs too because it was like a lesbian relationship that was there too that was mm-hmm. kind of being explored. I did, I'm not even going to go into that aspect of it. Just her as herself as her own character. I just felt like she deserved a little bit more than that. Um so that was one thing. We already talked about it, but Historia's pregnancy, I just felt like it was unnecessarily confusing. It just detracted from all the other big stuff happening. It just wasn't necessary to be so mysterious about it. It wasn't fun or like, haha, at the end. It was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Agreed. again, my other thing is mostly related to the last chapter as well, Justin, which is just what we've already talked about. Um, 
kind of poor dialogue, that line, and I know people have just been memeing the crap out of it online, but where Armin thanks Aaron for becoming a mass murderer on behalf of everybody, something along those lines yeah. that I've seen that <laughs> memed and, and ripped apart across the internet for good reason. Um, <laughs> Rightfully so. It, it's so jarring compared to how great he's been with dialogue through the whole series. Yeah. I, I totally agree, and I, I think it even further is kind of a unfortunate um, kind of muddleness of Armin's character, where I know a lot of people have also theorized like that this entire story is being told through Armin, because he is basically telling the the tale of Aaron and how they get to where they are. And exactly to your point, Taylor, like, he's an individual that thinks very critically about situations. He very rarely lets... Um, emotions except in you know some instances take over kind of these decisions as much as it pains him but he really puts the thought into his his words and what he's trying to um kind of bring others together for so for him in that final chapter just be like hey cool like yeah you killed a bunch of people like that's awesome like okay we're cool and it's just like Armin would never be okay with that but maybe you know it's just that final closure of like he knows that these are aaron's final moments mm -hmm. and he's losing his best friend mm -hmm. And well, so yeah, he, I think he, he does have that change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was just trying to absolve him and tell him what he needed to hear to basically pass on peacefully. But like, yeah. I think I'm I meant it more almost in terms of like for the readers. <laughs> I, uh, like, I, almost, okay. I almost feel like it was like just a poor translation. You know what I mean? It just felt Could be. like such an awkward way to word it that it, it it was just very different than my experience with previous chapters. There was even that other section, too, when Aaron and Armin are talking where Aaron or uh, Armin or some somehow they start talking about Aaron's feelings for Mikasa and you know Aaron falls on the floor crying and he's like no I really do love her I really do want her to only ever think about me and uh, again I think it's fair that he has those sentiments but like but like I never felt any feelings from Aaron romantic feelings from Aaron towards Mikasa like the whole series so that was already my first issue was like have a sprinkling of that somewhere in the series at some point. Um, and then like my second issue with it was like how serious the tone had been. And then it kind of, it almost was like borderline comedic, but like also sad. And also the dialogue just felt, was, I can't even think of the word, just, just jarring to me. So I don't know. Did yeah. you guys feel the same way about that scene with about Aaron's feelings for Mikasa or is that just me? It what do you think, like, Johan? <laughs> I feel like Aaron, which goes to one of the two things I didn't love about the series. I think, like, I mean, Aaron didn't like he gave her a scar, but the main, the main, my main problem with Mikasa and Aaron from the beginning, like the core problem, is like, bro, weren't you like brother and sister? Didn't yeah, your right? family like bring I her know. in when you were a kid and you grew up with her, and then now yeah. you love your sister? It's like weird. That's weird. That's <laughs> fucked up, man. It's like, no, let me cuss up you free. And Mikasa too is like, oh, we grew up together and we're like brothers, so I love him. He's like, yeah. I mean, I don't have brothers or sisters, but I'm pretty sure that's not how it goes with brothers and sisters. It's like, that's not right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the other thing I don't like is like, why in every single big manga, there has to be a point where the lazy writing or oh, it's because he was he loved him or she loved him has to come out. Like when we're talking about King Fritz and Yimmer, like everyone was expecting, like, why didn't you do some crazy shit? You know, why didn't you kill him if he was such a bitch to you? I was expecting something like, oh, because it was part of my plan or I needed to use him. It's like, no, I loved him. And it's like, really? You loved him? That's like your response? I mean, it makes sense, but it makes too much sense. You know, that's like, Love being this driving force, it's something that is being used every single day in every manga that I can think of. Mm -hmm. And I don't love that. I get it. But it's like, you know, that's, yeah. As for Eren, Eren's feelings for Mikasa, I almost feel like he had to do it just so that he wouldn't be like, oh, you know, like Eren was a heartless bitch or something. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eren loved Mikasa too. I think it's if like... anything, it... oh, sorry. You have no, more that's there. Okay. no okay. it was like I don't I don't buy it. Yeah. No, I think if anything, it's it, it more for me was just a a showing of that Aaron really never matured in this story. 
he kind of always remained in that child-esque state. I mean, even think about, you know, back to the chapters where um, he's shown in paths or whatever it is when, you know, all the Titans are rumbling over and he's kind of, as a child, you know, he has his arms open in like this very kind of like um, paradise-esque viewpoint of the world. And I think at that moment, you know, Aaron really does realize like, this is it. This is the end. And kind of to your point, Taylor, of like these frustrations of just like, why don't you tell Mikasa you love her back? Like you big idiot. Like, you know, she's, you know, poured her heart out again and time and time again. And, you know, I was even looking back at the end of season two when, you know, Dina is coming up and, and Mikasa confesses that love very directly to Aaron. And I think at that moment when Aaron's talking to Armin, he really is going back to that child state of like, man, I'm such an idiot. Like of, I should have, you know, really confessed it. I don't want her to be with anybody else. Like she's mine. It's very, he's throwing a temper tantrum. There, there's nothing else to explain there. And I, I think, you know, it makes sense, at least in my mind, yeah. of, of why he would do that, just because he he lost focus along the way. There's so mm -hmm. many other things that he had to do. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, Yohan, I'm, I'm kind of glad for it because it would have been the easy route of him to be like, oh, yeah, you know, it was really our love that made <laughs> me, you know, drive to this force or the kind of these more cliche kind of explanations. So I feel That's like some something that he could have done very strongly Sayama would be like throughout the series like if Eren every time he saw Mikasa they had like a little shared view or shared glance where you, they didn't say anything but Eren was looking at Mikasa and they were like <laughs> oh you know or something nice happened and then he looked at her but nothing nothing of that no, there was never anything there yeah. was never <laughs> any hint that he had feelings towards that's what annoys me it's just like if there had even just been a glance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like a blush at one point or something. One time, I wouldn't have forgotten it. I'd have been like, oh, he likes her. Mm -hmm. you know he know gave her I mean? his car. So that I happened. Her family was murdered in front of her <laughs> and he rescued her from sexual traits like sex slavers. Yeah, he gave her a scarf. <laughs> hey, good man right there. I will the say best. this, though. Justin, when we were talking about that scene where at the end of season two where Dina comes up and, and Mikasa says that to Aaron, I was so dead set on thinking that there was nothing happening between them because I thought of them really as siblings. Like, that's just what I thought we were supposed to basically think because apparently I'm an idiot. And I didn't even realize that she was confessing. And I remember talking with a friend way after that, that happened. And my friend was like, oh, I laughed so hard when Mikasa basically you know, confesses everything to Aaron and leans in for the kiss. And then he just gets up and looks away or yeah, something. Looks back I, was at like, Dina. I was like, when did that happen? She said, are you kidding me? Right before Dina. And I went back and read it and I, and I realized, oh, wow, that just completely flew past my head. So I guess I should maybe give a little bit of credit to Aaron. He had a lot of other things. On his head. If I missed it, surely he could miss it too. Yeah. Sorry, Picasso. Um... Oh yeah, so Johan, were there anything was there anything you wanted to talk about for like bones to pick from the series in general? No, it's like a pretty well rounded off. I as I said I like the end and throw like probably one of my favorite things about the series were like the the stronger like characters died at the beginning. So it was like, oh okay, so eventually when Erwin died, it was like, okay, big papa that knew the shit died. Now, Armin, it's your turn. Now, you know, Hanji, Hanji grew a lot. And it was like, it's your turn to do things. But like that scene, um, the training arc, of course, when they were all becoming soldiers, I loved that. But then when uh, when Erwin, like everyone thinks that he's going to die because, you know, they beat his arm up. But he's like, no, keep going. We need to get Eren. It's like those parts of the story, like where even though they were losing, they had to keep going. Basically, Erwin. Yeah, Erwin was my favorite part of the of the series, and it's like you know, yeah. there will never, well, probably there will, but there's there's no one I can think of that compares closely to what Erwin did, because yeah. you know that's that's a pretty high peak. Like even if the flashbacks, he was there, and every time we see Erwin, it's like ah yes, you know, it's like Erwin's back. Well, I think that that's a that's a perfect segue in the sense of kind of the the saddest deaths or favorite characters mm -hmm. that we had from these series. I know there's a ton of them, but maybe if you had to round out, say like top two or three, who was who is locking it down from the entire series now that things are said and done for you guys? I I cried for like an entire night when Hanji died. Like seriously, it was so it was so devastating to me. I can only be thankful for the fact. That she went out on her own terms. 
She went out just being super true to herself. She had a great tragic sad goodbye with Levi, but like just everything about it was so well done. And then we didn't even have to see really like the the brutality of it. You know, the author actually kind of cen censored some of that by just not showing us the panels and you see her just wake up kind of in like an afterlife saying hi to her fallen comrades and she mm -hmm. out of everybody, out of many of the characters, she actually had a very nice send off things considered but it was still i cried for like an entire night she was my favorite anybody else i mean i can go on about characters but does anybody else want to share their their worst stuff mm. i'm still thinking do you have one off the top of your head johan i'm still kind of uh, besides Erwin, Erwin, here. yeah because, because everyone was like even when he was laying there it's like i can make you tight head you know you can be like double the badass he's like so like, were you come were you then when they were debating about who they should save Erwin versus Armin? Were you like stupid, stupid people save Erwin? Is that what you? <laughs> I was like, that's the only reasonable option. Like, go with Erwin. He knows his shit. He would be really, really strong. He would make a bunch of different strategies. But then I respected him the most because he went like, my time has come. You know, it's time for the new, like, the new generation to come. And then I went like, bitch, if you had had the Titan powers, you could have gotten your arm back. Like, no time! Just regenerate like that. But then the it, the series evolved when Erwin died for me, and when they said, like, you know, um, Armin, just give you the serum. I was surprised that Levi followed that order, because he knew better. You know, it was, Armin did a good job, but come on, it's Erwin. But he was like, okay, I, I will follow you because I'm attached to you. I will follow your orders. Mm -hmm. I think, if anything, that's just a testament to how fantastic and how beloved Erwin as a character is. Mm -hmm. You know, against all odds of everybody that loves Erwin, he, you know, really was able to, in his final moments, realize what was best for humanity moving forward. It wasn't, you know, bringing him back and, you know, kind of him further pursuing his ideals of, you know, coming to the the answer that his father had, had you know, questioned of, you mm -hmm. know, the history of this world and everything. And so I, I, I totally agree there with understanding, like, you know, I was kind of admittedly even in the same boat of like, oh, why would we pick Armin? Like, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Erwin has done all these things. He's been the one driving force that really has gotten them to this place. Yes, Armin did help with some of the other, like, strategical focuses. But without Erwin, like, we really mm -hmm. wouldn't be here. And there wouldn't be this as strong of a foundation with the uh, 104th, you know, cadets group. Um, in terms of saddest deaths for me... Oh, man. Um... I think now that I look at a series as a whole, and I admittedly, I didn't think it was as sad, but I think Marco was a really oh. sad and tragic death oh. for a character that, you know, isn't able to, we don't learn a lot about him because he obviously dies very early on in the series. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, what makes it really sad is the events of how his death happened, where, you know, he's coming up with the 104th cadet group with, you know, um, Armin, Mikasa, Jean, Connie, all of them, like he was part of the gang. And <laughs> due to his unfortunate happening upon, you know, Reiner and Bertholdt talking about, you know, their plans not going accordingly because they see, you know, this other Titan has now come up and, and put a dash in their plan. And, you know, here comes Marco being good guy, Marco, like, what, hey, what what do you mean, Titans? And they're just like, what? You know, they both kind of look at each other and they're like, Marco, what what did you say? And he's like, hey, hey guys, like, what were you just talking about? And then you know, Annie comes up and they're just like, yo, Annie, like, Marco knows. And Annie just has you know this absolute fear. And I think that was something for me that when I look back at it, I was just like, damn, the like realization and emotion that Isayama draws on Annie's face in that moment. Because I think for Annie, even though she killed a lot of characters comparative to Reiner and Bertolt she really probably suffered the most mm -hmm. from that um, because she was the one that I personally think had the most kind of best abilities to do that kind of work. Um, but yeah, when it then comes to Marco, who's good guy, Marco, he just gets left for Titan father and they, and they, you know, strip him of his maneuver gear and stuff like, man, I cannot think of a, of a worse possible death. And I would think that, Hey, if I was in this world of attack on Titan, that would probably be me, honestly. I'd be a guy who has, like, nothing special about him, and I just roll up on this unfortunate <laughs> circumstance, wrong place, wrong time, and now here I am, you know, get my my body torn in half. So that was mm -hmm. one for me that I think, now that I look back, that one really resonated a lot, even though it was something, oh. yeah. It, well, and it, it wasn't even just impactful on us as the readers, but it was really impactful on several of the characters as well. I mean, Reiner, 
Mr. PTSD, like disassociative personality, like he was the one that ordered it. And then later, minutes later, is bawling about the decision. Um, Bertolt, poor Bert Bertolt is just dealing with Reiner this, this whole time, trying to figure out how to manage this man while also now losing Marco. And then Annie, yeah, I agree with you. I think that Annie really, um, probably just got hit the hardest. She, she, she she reminds me a lot of my mom actually where like i know that my they have very similar personalities where like i feel like they'll feel things really hard for like a split second there and then they just like shove it all down <laughs> and just like mm. because they feel things so much they just they they bury it so they never have to touch it again that's very much yeah. like the feeling i get from annie and i think it's because of situations like that that she's been in there that happened to her that she's become like that and it was really, you're right, the way it was drawn was just really brutal. It was funny because the one person out of the entire manga, the one person that really wanted to die every chance he got, Bertolt, he never died. It was like, nope, you're freaking immortal, man. You, you mean you Reiner? Have... Reiner wanted Reiner, to die. Yeah, Reiner, <laughs> Reiner, sorry, yeah. Reiner, Reiner. Reiner was like, you're not dying, my boy. <laughs> man. Like, even at the end, he took shots for Annie when they were in the final battle, and he was like, okay, just please kill me. Then. No, you can't. <laughs> But I, I have to raise a question for both of you. At the very end, do you forgive Gavi no, from Gabby. killing yeah, our yeah. dear potato girl? I do. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand totally. I, I was never... Well, I mean, you, Justin, you know, you've heard me on the podcast and we've talked. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I just feel like I, uh, I completely understand where Gabby was coming from mentally. She's... I, I actually kind of have some respect for her because as she's a a baby practically and she is so dedicated to trying to build a better life for her family following what she thinks is the way to do that like she is putting a thousand percent into what she's been told will build a better future for her and her family and so like i mean i really can't fault her for for what she did because that's everything she's ever she was acting on anything she's ever known in her entire life and then right after seeing her city ripped apart by this person that she thinks is a terrorist so yeah. i mean am i devastated that sasha died absolutely but i i can't hate gabby even when she's being fucking annoying for like chapters after that in paradise i still don't <laughs> fault her or hate her yeah I would, I would i would agree with that where i would forgive gabby in the regards of just you know the situation that she finds herself in like it, it's easy and i think for you know us as readers because we knew so much about sasha and we become so attached to it mm -hmm. it was kind of initially easy for us to be like damn like this bitch like you know how could she do this to one of our beloved characters but when you mm -hmm. step back you got to realize it's like exactly the taylor's point like this is war this are things that ideologies have been built up from both sides admittedly of like this is the life that they know they're trying to better the life of those around them and and think further you know right before this gabby had her two kind of best friends mm -hmm. in the warrior groups be brutally crushed by Aaron um, mm -hmm. when he kind of revealed himself after Willie's speech. So um, I, I can forgive her in, in that instance. And I know another thing not working in her favor was when she blew Aaron's head off with the sniper. Um, I think that was another thing that for Gabby haters, they were just like, oh man, like she does this first and now this, like, oh, this some shit. So uh, I really can't wait for the anime onlys to see that moment and, and see that initial, you know, refueling of the fires of just the hate train that is Gabby. Can't um, wait to hear Sasha's thoughts. That's what oh I mean. Oh man, it's going to be, it's going to be so good. Um, but no, to, to your point, Johan, I, I think I forgive her in that regard just because war is war. Things happen for, for various reasons. And at the end of the day, it, it, it really comes down to when do you stop the cycle of violence and obviously paradis wasn't stopping that cycle they were continuing it it was an eye for an eye and i think that was another kind of big thing that you can take away from this series is like that eye for an eye mentality like that's what really needs to change because when you're taking an eye for an eye nobody mm -hmm. wins you're blind at the end of the day things happen exactly hmm. mm. so should we segue into we're kind of coming up on the two hour mark here. Should we segue into yeah. like some of our favorite moments here? And then we can talk about like our thoughts maybe for the upcoming season. Wait, no, sorry. The final, final season part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, yeah, let's, let's end on a, like, on a high note, unless there's anything you guys want to talk about beforehand. Let's talk about our, our favorite arcs. Yeah. 
that that works for me. Yeah. I can I can start since we okay. already mentioned it. This whole uh, that whole scene, Midnight Sun, that episode of Midnight Sun in season three, where there is that decision between Erwin and Armin. I'm not like that was probably one of the most intense TV viewing experiences I'd ever had because I hadn't read the manga yet. So as I was watching it, literally on the literally on the edge of my seat and like screaming at the screen, I had looked up before that episode to see if Armin was going to die because I was so scared about Armin dying that season. And so I looked it up and it said he was alive. And then as he's getting burned on the screen in front of me, I'm freaking out looking at my friends like, is, you, did, is this a lie? Did I miss something? That was terrifying. I'm not going to speak on whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision. I mean, I think that that's what makes this show so brilliant. As we've talked about, it was a tough decision. There's a lot that you can say on either side. And I just thought that it was like brilliantly executed and even outside of just that moment like for example like levi and Irwin talking on the other side of the wall as zeke is just hammering them with these rocks you're literally like if you look at the air it's literally like you can see the droplets of blood in the air it's just like a hellhole over there and like seeing their conversation and hearing like i remember when when Irwin sat down and he was like God damn it. I just really wanted to know what was in that basement. I felt so bad for him. I had never personally, Erwin never really had that much of an impact on me and I'm not sure why. And I, when I go through it all again, I think I'll probably appreciate him a little bit more, but like that moment there, I felt for him so strongly. And I just thought, I just thought that those episodes were just the best, just brilliantly executed. Um, other than that, I put down the conversation between Magath and Shadis, um, like as after the Jaeger is to come into attack and after that whole sequence at the um, the dock before, or like, I guess during the rumbling, I should say, because I think, it, yeah, it started by that point. Mm -hmm. There was a scene where uh, where Magath and Shadis is very short, but it's just they happen to run into each other. They've both come in. Live, you know, they're basically fighting for the same side at this point, just trying to save humanity. Really, they've been united. And they both compliment each other on their leadership skills before they both sacrifice themselves to the cause. You know, it ends with you knowing they both die. And I just, I don't know why it stuck with me so much. It, there weren't major characters. And I think that's maybe why it did hit me so much was because it, I found it so impressive that they were people who hadn't had that much screen time. And Megath, especially, most of it, you're, you're meant to hate him. I mean, he, maybe not hate him, but he's on the Marleyan side. And, He's not, he hasn't been with the characters that we've been fighting alongside for so long. You shouldn't be so like sentimental towards him. But just by those time, by that, by the time it got to that point, I really felt for both of them and felt where they'd come from. And I thought Isayama did a great job of character development there. Um, Agreed. And then uh, we've mentioned it before, so I'll just a brief thing. I think that the way that Isayama went through and showed how Aaron had nudged everything the right way to get onto his path, like with, like with what happened with Dina and his mom, and how it had to go that way. Where am I saying that right? Yeah, every everything that happened with his mom, basically. <laughs> I just thought it was really well shown and and just very impactful. So I put that on there as well because it's really hard to do anything good with time travel. <laughs> yeah, it is. Good so those are my three. Justin. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, man, it's so hard, honestly, and kind of as you said, with so many things that have happened mm -hmm. through the season with such a wide cast of characters and really how, you know, the transition from season three to season four introduces us to it, the world at a whole. Um, for me, I would say a lot of my favorite moments, honestly, were actually towards the beginning of the series with seasons one and two. And I know season two uh for the first bit was a little bit of a black sheep season a lot of people don't yeah. have the most fondest memories of it which i honestly can't understand why because in season two we learn a lot of titan reveals we mm -hmm. get the moment of Bert holt and reiner revealing both their identities and really that impact on aaron um and again that was just a, a well-balanced scene in my mind of just the music the animation like everything coming together perfectly and more so like the cherry on top of the cake is when Aaron is is jumping off the edge of the wall and tears are you know rolling down his eyes as he's screaming that at them for being traitors because you know you they have this entire past with each other of 
these were their brothers in arms. These were these individuals that basically lied to everyone's face and said, you know, hey, we're in this for the betterment of humanity and for all that to kind of come to this boiling point and just be executed in the way that it does. Like, even so, you know, if we if we talk about kind of favorite music down the line here, like that specific track alone, like mm. always gives me chills and goosebumps. Um, another favorite moment of mine was actually season one when um, uh, it's one of the first kind of uh, missions that the team is having where they're trying to fight against, you know, Titans and um, Aaron at this point has been eaten in terms of, you know, sacrificing to save Armin and Mikasa, you know, has, has learned of this and, and she's kind of doing her best to keep, you know, cool and collected. And she has that moment of kind of weakness where she's giving up the fight, where she's like, man, like, what, what are we doing this all for? You know, here I am, I've lost, you know, the one person I've loved. And, you know, when it comes to those moments of her finally giving up, we have like the one scene of kind of her survival instincts kicking in. I think they kind of focus on like a blood cell and kind of like that, like reacting awakening. But just as she's about to do that, here comes, you know, this Titan that later on we know is Aaron, but that just steps over her and just does this, you know, super um, climactic, like haymaker punch to this Titan that I think like <laughs> spins around the other Titan's head like three or four times. And man, like I was on the edge of my seat, just like, whoa go and, and you know i didn't even know it was aaron at the time because i don't think they had shown his face yet um but it was just like oh that was super hype for me um so i would say those two moments for me specifically um were, were really favorites of mine yeah that was a really iconic scene mm -hmm. i can still picture i haven't seen that episode in a very very long time and i never read that part in the manga and i could still picture in my head exactly what that punch looked like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Johan, oh, what about you punching. Uh, I have to say that my favorite episode or my favorite part of the anime itself and probably the entire series is the face that Levi puts like that split second. The only time I've seen that I remember Levi kind of scared because he realizes he's fighting against Kenny and it's like, holy shit. Like when, I, when they were when he was following the cart where they were taking Garen, but it was like, oh, here's Kenny and Kenny's, you know, team and Kenny goes like, hey. Uh, Levi, have you grown up yet? You know, like, mm -hmm. how are your skills? And then he goes against Levi, I mean, Kenny. It's like, you know, Levi is not going to run from a fight, but for one second, he goes like, I might be in danger here. Like, I need to, <laughs> instead of just attack, 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 I need to do a defensive move. Like, when he covers himself up so he doesn't get shot, and then he jumps to the other side of, of Kenny, mm -hmm. I went like, this is a man. This is not a titan. And Levi is scared of him. It's like, Okay, you know that shit's gonna go down, and that, like Kenny is gonna be a pretty important character. Like the, I I like a lot Kenny because he gives us the backstory of Levi, and that's probably my second favorite part. Like when we see Levi as a kid, like the story of his mom being a prostitute that dies, and that there were a lot of things like, oh, is Kenny his father? Is Kenny his uncle? Like his mom just died, and Levi was. There are this poor little kid almost starving to death, just standing there waiting for nothing to happen to dead eyes. And then Kenny goes like, yeah, I'm going to make you a murderer, like a killing machine. But it works out because he made the perfect soldier, I want to say. I love that. And then probably those are two. And then one of like in that moment, I loved it. And then they kind of screwed it up when uh, Eren dies, not dies, but when Eren gets eaten by the Titan, I went like, do we have a series that actually just killed their main character? <laughs> I went like, this is great. I like where this is going. This is freaking Tengen, Topagur, and Laganor all, all over again. And then it's the result. Of, oh, you know, now it was just a power up. He, he's actually a Titan and he's alive. I was like, I mean, I get it. But if the main character died on a series and giving like taking the hope out of everyone, that was like that. that Split second where I didn't realize that Army, uh, Aaron was gonna be alive. It was like, wow, they have some balls in this anime. There's a couple of romantic dramas I can recommend to you where the main characters die. If you want some of those, I'll try. That would, I can be, help you out. That would be very good because <laughs> there it is. I love it. There's always one second main character that becomes the main character, like Gordon Lagan. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I like when main characters die because it's like you know this is important story. Like Madoka Magica, when Mami dies, it's like. Did you really fucking kill Mami in one shot? Yes, they did. Don't worry if you haven't watched it. It's, it happens very early. I mean, technically, 
technically Aaron did die though. I mean, really from the, especially like in the ending, if you look at like the cat, well, if, skipping the 80% of people that got rumbled that we don't know who they are. Okay? <laughs> I mean, yeah. dis disregarding that out of the people that we know in the ending, basically everybody lived and is fine. Right. And Aaron yeah. is really the mm -hmm. only one. And beyond even dying, it was almost like a fate worse than death because of what we were talking about earlier. Out of everybody, he was the one that was never free. So really, I mean, yeah. if you wanted that dark shit, Johan, I mean, Isayama's got your back just, just a couple, like a hundred chapters <laughs> later. I was like, that would have been my favorite, like, my favorite ending if everyone just turned out to be pure evil. As I said, if Aaron was this evil lord that went like, fuck everyone, I'm going to be the king, I would be like, I'm down for that 100%. <laughs> that is so cold. That's so cold. Yeah. <laughs> that was really, I think I think the balls to do that is is quite quite large to, you know, for Isayami yeah. even. I think he he definitely did a good balance of of mm -hmm. being that, you know, tragic and, and darker folk, but man, yeah, that would have been quite the thing if if that's how, you know, things unfolded. Mm -hmm. I think would have been I got only think about Berserk for it in, in certain ways. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Berserk definitely has those those yeah. kind of things to it. So I I feel like with, with with this group, the three of us here, I feel like Johan's on the end of like, I want to watch it all burn. And I'm on the end of like, I think this is probably not the best writing, but I don't give a shit. I, everybody's live and I'm okay with it. And I feel like Justin's in the middle. <laughs> mm, it's like yeah. yeah I wanna <laughs> I wanna see some burn, but I'm just more like, oh, I wanna see just, you know, like the mystery and the darkness be unfolded behind it and whether or not it gets to like the whole world burning at an end like i'm definitely okay with it but it's more so like okay what are the devices that we're showing like man shit is really dark like <laughs> mm -hmm. so i'm i'm a, i'm definitely a masochist in, in that regard <laughs> I, think I think first... i think yeah oh no go, go ahead. ahead Justin. i was just gonna say i think to your point taylor it's a testament more so of like the writing needs to be really good for that mm -hmm. to really make a show stand apart. Cause I think sometimes it's easy to kind of go that route mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's the writing that, that makes it uh, stand yeah. apart. So that you don't end up with something like a game of Thrones ending where it feels unearned, where you just went completely one direction and left people bamboozled because there was nothing leading <laughs> up to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Definitely. He avoided that. So those were our favorite moments. Justin, you mentioned earlier that you wanted to talk about like some some music. I kind of just threw that on there because I'm somebody who's like I've listened to both the vocal tracks and mm -hmm. I have like the just the instrumental soundtracks as well. And I listened yeah. for for a hot second there last year. I was listening to them all like every day, all day long when I was oh, working. <laughs> that was me as well. Like the the soundtrack to a talent on Titan, more so just for the the animes that really have you know those stellar soundtracks perfect working music at the end of the day um for me you know uh i think this was the first series where um hiroyuki sawana the composer really kind of set the bar from an animation standpoint like before from like a you know irl a real kind of person media uh hans zimmer was kind of that mm -hmm. counterpart for his mm -hmm. iconic music and everything that i would i would usually work to and have on in the background um mm -hmm. but man it's it's so hard because of how many great soundtracks there were across you know the the series here and even you know admittedly to come with the the final season part two um but if i had to say like two favorite songs for me um one of them is the call of silence is the yes. name of the track that was what I said. um <laughs> and so that song is specifically played in the series when ymir awakens after being, you know, a mindless titan for for many many years, and consumes um, Porco's brother, um, mm -hmm. and just the weight and impact that is, you know, behind that song and the actual vocals of the song, and even you know the animation scenery. We have Ymir kind of waking up in kind of a, a desert esque aspect, and and looking out amongst the stars as like her new life or her her chance at a second life has been brought into play and. Man, that one still really resonates with me hardcore. Um, the other one, uh, a bit of, I guess, an outlier in the sense of this didn't come from the main Attack on Titan seasons. It actually came from the OVAs with Levi, um, mm -hmm. the No Regret series. Um, mm -hmm. And the name of the track is So Ist Est Immer. And that was my it, second one. Damn it, Justin. Oh, damn. We're, we're on <laughs> the same way. Like, and I figured for those that really love Levi, like this song would be a standalone because this is kind of like the titular mm -hmm. track from those OVAs. 
Um, and so I was kind of, you know, again, looking at like the, the translations of that. And for that song specifically, that translates roughly to it is as always, which basically I equated to for Levi through the events of these OVAs, you know, he loses both of his best friends from the underground as a result of meeting with, with Erwin and, and running into Titans and things of that nature. But it really was a callback for him that after these very tragic moments, all he really wants at the end of the day is kind of that return to normalcy, spending these afternoons or these evenings with, you know, obviously not in the best conditions, but you have family, you have these individuals that you're sharing that with. And at the end of the OVA, he doesn't have that anymore. He's now putting this faith in Erwin and the Survey Corps. And that just really resonated with me as well. That's that's yeah. that's my two two standalones. And sorry to to take your thunder a little bit, Taylor. Maybe I you shouldn't have asked me to go first. I didn't think we'd you know no, out of okay. all the songs here, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. You uh you said it beautifully, and so great job on that. Completely agree with you. All right, so, since you picked those two, I'll pick two more kind of hype songs. Which um, I have to go back and rewatch through it again. I'm pretty sure they do play it at some point in the anime, but I, I can't remember if or when they do. But I know that it was in one of the PVs and it's called Zero Eclipse and it's sung mm. by Hiroyuki Sawano. And again, that one's just kind of a hype song. It was great for PVs. Um, like I said, I can't remember when it was in the anime. Do you remember if it was in the anime, Justin? Because I really uh... can't recall. I know the song. I'm actually on my other monitor, like looking it up right now to see if they have a direct correlation. Because I, I honestly don't at this time remember yeah, if it I was don't... used as a specific scene in the anime. I don't think they did, but it's a great song. And then there was another one called Barricades that played um, earlier on. It was mm -hmm. like probably, probably like late season one or sometime early season two. I remember that they played it at one point when the when the cadets were. Um, riding back into the walls after an excursion and it was basically talk i mean the song is basically about escaping your barricades finding freedom things like that it was like near the end of some big arc or end of a season or something and it was such a good hype song so if anybody checks out the um if anybody checks out the the soundtrack at any point definitely like listen to those I don't sorry, I don't have an emotional connection to those quite as much. They're just great hype songs. <laughs> but for yeah. one more emotional song, there's also I'm gonna just butcher the name of this. But it's v vocal im Kafig. Yeah. And that's that's one that they actually did have in this last season too. They did like an instrumental of it with Reiner, uh, with a scene with Reiner as well. And so that one's been remixed and put into the show a couple different times, and that one's beautiful too. Okay, really, at the end of the day, anybody that's li that's listening, please just do yourself a favor and download the soundtrack. You d won't even realize that you needed it until you have it, and then you'll never look back. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Johan. I don't know if you care about this stuff at all. <laughs> I do because I mean. I'm a sucker for intros, and I mean, Attack on Titan did something like every intro, like oh, intro. first season, yeah, <laughs> like first season, when you go like, um, what's the name of it, uh, Guren no Yumiya, you're going to go like, mm -hmm. okay, they're not going to top this. And then they go into the second intro, and like every intro is good, and it's fitted very well for the season, so it's like, they're doing a pretty good job. And then, of course, Sasha and me, every time we see each other, we go like, ah, Sasayu, Sasha. Oh yes, Attack on Titan. <laughs> it's like you know, it's uh, half of my playlist for the gym is Attack on Titan intros because they're all so hyped. Now you remember, and then the cinematics they used for the intro itself is like with uh, Shinzo was a saga. You know, it's like every living thing has a soul. Animals, mm -hmm. you know, even plants, human beings, the Titans have the same like soul kind of thing as the humans. Like you know, it's just great. And I mean, of course, I like the like the songs that they use throughout the series. But when I'm watching that anime, I don't really pay attention. It's like, oh, that sounds really good. But fuck, you know, Levi no. is killing someone. I'm really fine. And I don't think you're alone there. I think it's something that there's so much going on in such a great manner. It, it's hard mm -hmm. to, you know, keep it all in. I think me and Taylor are definitely potentially more biased towards the focus on, you know, the music <laughs> and soundtracks. And that's when you see us kind of being like, oh, yeah, like, when did that happen? Or what was going on during those scenes? Because we're so enthralled with the music mm -hmm. as like its own <laughs> direct medium. Um but for, for no. openings, oh, sorry, Justin. Go oh, no, ahead. Go ahead. I, well, I was just going to say for Barricade specifically, um, the scene that at least I saw here that they use it for is when um, Historia is riding Ymir as Ymir is a Titan. Um, oh, yeah, that's that during the battle of season. That's when they play one of them, mm -hmm. and Ymir, or Historia, hops off and like goes and fights mm -hmm. alongside Ymir. 
So I think that's fitting, too, because I know you said, you know, Ymir was one of the characters that you really wanted to see more of and kind of get her closure in that whole relationship between both Historia and Ymir, which I think is one of, you know, the, like, main pyramids or or pillars of the series that Mm -hmm. really got its love but didn't get the closure, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's all I had to say in terms of just the relation to the the songs that you mentioned. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, I do remember it there. It wasn't the scene I was thinking of, but yeah, it was there. It was there. That's great. Um, but talking about openings, uh, Johan, how, were you a fan of Red Swan, the one that I believe Hyde contributed to? Was it Hyde? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the beginning, I was like, are you really going to use these for Attack on Titan? But after <laughs> hearing it like 50 times, I'm like, you know, it, that's a cardio song, you know, it's not for popping, it's not for lifting, probably. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, you know, I'll take that. It's it's pretty good. And, yeah. and the budget that they used, which I think we'll talk about probably when uh, we're, what are we expecting for the season, uh, second part of the final season. Let's just segue into that. I think we've kind of yeah. covered the music here. Let's segue into it. it. It's like, you know, the main thing that comes to my mind, it's going to be MAPA. If you're listening to this, if you're hearing by any way or any form of this podcast, some ways please, the stars align. Listen to this man. <laughs> give a raise, pay extra time. I know Japan is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you extra. Okay, just make them work like, you know, at night so that you can pay them double or something. The amount of animation, of CGI, of everything that it's going to go into this, like the animation of the final season, uh, uh, part two, it's like, you know, just the amount of CGI or animation that they're going to need for the rumbling alone, taking away fighting, taking away everything, it's going to be like either this is going to be a very, you know, I don't want it. I don't want them to rush the animation, you know, because there's a lot of very hard animation that you're going to have to do, like all the Titans, Titans fighting against everyone, uh, all the death, you know, that scene where all of the all of the people are just jumping to the abyss and then they lift the baby and then put the like they send the mm-hmm. baby back and the titans in the background and the different cities that they are like looking at where the rumbling is happening it's like i don't know if they're gonna use a lot of like um a lot of dust to cover maybe some of the harder parts because it's very gory it's mm-hmm. very very gory so i don't know I would love for them, again, because I'm a freaking psychopath, I would love to them for just show the blood and show everything, like, just shattering around, like, Tokyo Ghoul style. I'll take mm-hmm. that. Elephant Light or Lead, mm-hmm. I'll take that any day. But it's, like, the amount of animation that they're going to have, the amount, the budget that they are going to have. Mappa is just going to be balling with the Season 2, or I hope that they do that, because... If they do like if they don't put all of their love doing the second season, it's gonna the final season second part, it's gonna be like, you know, people are gonna for sure complain. Because mm-hmm. there's just so many scenes that are so that have so much detail within them. Like, how are you gonna explain five different kinds of Warhammer Titans all at once? Like how are you gonna draw them, draw them, draw them differently? Like oh the feathers. Gosh. I was exhausted. That whole entire last fight oh. is going to be mm-hmm. a <laughs> endeavor in and of itself know. of like a single, yeah. you know, and anime. I just, I just hope they don't overuse the CGI. Some parts just deserve to be, you know, drawn. Yeah. Instead of CGI. I hope that they're, that I have no idea. Like, I mean, I feel like David knows more about this stuff. I, I get the idea of shooting schedules and needing to time things out. And you have certain people on certain crews working on certain things by contract. I get all that. I hope that whatever they've got going on for this second season, that they were able to give their animators more time and leeway to, mm. to, to do that. Because my understanding is that this last season, by the time that they had this put onto their plate, they'd already had so many other commitments and animators on different projects. And it was just... They did the best that they could. And I still think it was fantastic. But like, I mean, I'd be lying if I said that, you know, I still kind of miss the stuff from the previous seasons with wit. Like what you were talking about earlier, Johan, with that scene with Kenny and Levi, Mm -hmm. that was talked about pretty much almost as much as that scene from episode 19 of Demon Slayer. You know, Mm -hmm. I see those two scenes as like pretty much touted as like some of the best animation to ever happen in the history of animation. So, um. You know, they they had some fantastic scenes or like even like that one. I don't know if you guys remember, but before 
they go into that battle in season three with like the beast titan and everything when when aaron has to harden do that crystal hardening mm-hmm. to like close that hole and he like mm-hmm. uses his gear to go over the top of the gate like that that animation there was so clean and like when you read it in the when you read it in the manga, it was basically like two panels, like he's up and now he's down, and then you see it and it's like, God damn, that was just beautiful. It felt so yeah. epic. And I miss those things, and I'd love to see them. I'd love to see them in the last part. But I'm no. gonna try to play devil's advocate because I know people have been so hard on them, and I feel really bad for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Something no, I... that I don't. Want... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, Johan. You're good. It's... Just a little thing that I don't want Mappa to do because I can almost smell them doing it. They sometimes add little things. If they add a tear on Eren when Mikasa is killing him, I'm freaking dropping the shit. I'm not even going to watch the last 15 minutes or the last five minutes. Please, if they do that, I would get it because it would be like a nice little touch like, oh, I loved you. But no, if they add something, it's just perfect the way it is. Just animated frame by frame, which I feel that they are pretty good at doing. Yeah. Just, Just don't. Don't don't do weird stuff. Yeah. Don't be a hero. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't don't try to make the ending that you think from, you know, third party and fandoms mm-hmm. want to see. I, I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, to their credit, they they did a really good job with this first part of the final season where they didn't really take much creative freedom, which I really appreciated. I know there's a lot of backlash of that very jarring change in animation style where if you're not a manga reader that style of characters really throws you off from what you've experienced with wit. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the Taylor's point, the part that I'm hoping a little bit more brushing up on from Mappa is um, the animation and fight scenes and more so the usage of the maneuver gear. Cause exactly to your point, I think that's one of the things that wit had really crafted to a T Mm -hmm. in terms of like just the movement and the weight behind all of those scenes. And especially, you know, with that scene between Levi and Kenny for a human versus human aspect um, from furthermore uh, Levi versus Zeke for the first time in season three, when he's, you know, doing his iconical Beyblade spin maneuver and just how beautifully, you know, that's being animated as he's flying at speeds that, you know, we don't see anybody else on the survey corpse doing. Um, But in terms of, you know, part two, um, I hope they keep true to the material. I hope they don't try to take too many creative freedoms. Um, I really hope, you know, the the animators get the time and kind of um, trailing that, that they deserve to to bring that to light for the fan base, because I think otherwise, if they don't get that, the fan base is going to be critical. Nonetheless, they kind of take emotion out of it, which I really hate. They're really selfish at sometimes. And I know I can be selfish in sometimes as well. So um, I'm hoping that this won't be the case now that they have this leeway. Um, but I think for, for me, I'm really excited to see the anime only's response to, mm-hmm. to certain scenes and to the craziness of, you know, what's going to happen between Gabby and Aaron and, and him getting his head blown off. What's going to happen when, mm-hmm. you know, Aaron and Zeke enter into paths for the first time. Cause I don't think they've never seen paths, right? Like, is that the first time that paths no. is really no, they drawn in? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's going to be great. And I don't know, I guess talking back to <laughs> one of the things that like, I wasn't really psyched for, I- I'm worried to see what they think about like with paths as a concept and more so like this ideology of time travel or, or being kind of connected to everything. I think when, you know, we get to the parts when Zeke and Aaron are talking with each other about like all the scenes that they're looking at. I think that's going to be kind of interesting to see as well. But if any studio had to do it, I think MAPPA really solidified with the limited resources they had last part to erase any doubts. It's just like, hey, do what you know how to do. And to Johan's point, and as at any point, just don't change the material. Mm-hmm. We know you guys have the skills and the abilities. Just stay the course. And that's all I could ask for. Yeah. Don't put spoilers in the intro. Please, because like a lot of people are saying, yeah. oh, but that's the intro was a spoiler. It's not a spoiler. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's like you can't say that that's Aaron. Come on. I'm, ex- yeah. I'm excited to see that how to see people's reactions because one of the more shocking scenes for me from this series was when you find out that um, 
Aaron had kind of pulled the wool over Grisha's eyes and was maneuvering Grisha's actions mm -hmm. as well. I remember thinking, holy shit. And you had no, no idea what the heck was going through Aaron's brain at that point. And I was just like, oh my God, I could have never, ever guessed that this is what's happening. <laughs> like, what a time to be alive. Uh, like, that, that was one of my more powerful reactions. And so I can't wait for anime people to, <laughs> anime only to get through that part. Um, and I'm really excited to see the music that they pick for the last season. Um, and I'm curious to see too, maybe curious isn't the right word, but I, I'm anxious to see if they do make any changes. Cause you were saying that they, you know, that you want it to be like basically panel for panel. Let's just, you know, keep it on course. And I'm a little bit because of fan reactions to the last chapter. I wonder if anything will be changed, especially cause I feel like that's happening more and more yeah. often with certain beloved series <laughs> that you would never think that would happen to. I guess if that was to happen though i i imagine we're all in the consensus that it would need to come from isayama right like we wouldn't mm -hmm. want mappa to just try to take the wheel of what oh. they've you know maybe done research wise or seen on all these different forums and stuff justin you and i both know that that's not safe anymore though either <laughs> yeah i know like something that i Wishful think they, thinking <laughs> they could put in which looked very bad like uh when you see levi at the very end with his scars and with one white eye which still like damn that man's powerful mm -hmm. he's not like sitting with in a, in a wheelchair you know with a little uh with a little blanket in his legs he's just like falling sitting there with one like leg on top of the other one just waiting for shit to happen keep it that way don't make it you know the weak Levi like with a blanket because I could see them putting that like a blanket over his his feet and just something just like as small as that could be like you know that's not Levi Levi was mm -hmm. sitting down waiting for things to happen. Like, he, he knows he can't be aggressive, but you know that he can fuck things up. Like, <laughs> this last fight, he went like, I only need two fingers to get this done. You know, the two fingers are more than enough for me to fuck all these titans. So <laughs> just leave it like that. Yeah, agreed. So that's the thing that admittedly is going to be going to be tough for them because I think it's easy, you know, to, to do those really small things. But again... As we said earlier, with all our kind of feedback and and, and um, focuses, is that this fan base is one of the most critical fan bases that I personally have ever been a part of. You know, I've watched tons of different animes in the many years that I've been watching anime, and more so recently mangas as well. And I don't think I've ever seen such a crazy kind of discussion continue to go on for like a series. And just I would agree with that. Such small things. The only other thing I've ever seen this much discussion for, like so many extremely passionate feelings, was lost. To be honest, like I remember this mm. was this was lost it, in terms of scope, like how much stuff is going on, how many characters there are. I just kind of keep thinking of Lost or Game of Thrones. Oh, Game of Thrones, yeah. Like those those mm -hmm. two fandoms are crazy. But when it comes to anime, I think, yeah, I think Attack on Titan takes cake. Just wait for the ending of One Piece. That's going to be a mess. That's going to be... Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter what they do. People are going to be pissed. I can't yeah. even imagine. So. Well, anyways, so overall, we love the series. It's a masterpiece. Uh, no matter what happens with the second season, honestly, even if it was a steaming pile of garbage, like, I'm still, at the end of the day, like, I'm just happy. Like, I'm happy with how it ended. I feel fulfilled. I can't... I think it's really hard to do endings. Like think about how many things you've seen that have been long running and how many of those have actually had a good ending, like mm -hmm. almost none of them. So even though I think that there was a little bit of tripping and stuff like that, I, I think that overall he really hit the marks and I'm really, he's left behind just like a fantastic legacy for what you can do with anime and manga and with any medium in general, really. He's just an amazing artist and storyteller. Agreed. I, I yep. couldn't add anything better. So I'm just really happy that, you know, that we were able to to get together and, and share these sentiments. And um, for anyone, you know, that does stumble across this, this video, you know, please share your thoughts. Let us know what you thought of the closing chapters of the series interview as a whole. And again, as we all said, you know, this is a masterpiece and this is something that will continue to be talked about in reference for, for many years to come. Mm -hmm. So yeah. excited that we got to experience this during, during our lifetime here. I think it's something that's that's very fortunate when you kind of take a step back and look at all the things that you know you get to experience. So, does anybody Sasageo. else? <laughs> yes, Sasageo Sasageo. to the goddamn end. Mm -hmm. I don't 
know if uh i think we're ready to close out we're, we're all done here so um if there's anybody if you want like justin said earlier if you want to leave any comments we'll be posting this to youtube as well we're always happy honestly the three of us could talk about this stuff forever so feel free to share your thoughts i know that we did, definitely didn't cover everything we would need many more hours to do mm -hmm. that um i also did just want to do a really quick shout out to um i had watched some videos from a YouTuber whose name is totally not Mark. He did a three hour video, comprehensive video talking about the series um, in general. And he also did a response video to the last chapter. And I really can't have to, I have to send people his way too, because he did a brilliant job. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check out his videos. That's it. I think that we're going to end it here. I'll put his YouTube in the, in the, in our uh, description. Below. Descriptions? Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Retton. Yeah, Thanks. No problem. Thank you for the panel for uh for joining me for this conversation. It's been really fun. Of course. I mean, thank you, Taylor, for putting this all together. I think, you know, as Yohan and I were saying, it's easy for us to just pop in and, you know, talk about the things that we're passionate about, but it really takes someone like yourself to make these things happen. And you were the catalyst that, you know, got us here at the specific time and date, put together, you know, the the worksheet that we had for all the references, because Otherwise, we'd just be a rambling mess, and I think we knocked it out of the park, all thanks to your planning and effort. So thank you for putting this together. You are a very good host and a very good balance for my crazy yes. evilness. <laughs> if uh, if they give uh, Aaron a tear at the end, I'll watch the anime. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm, I'm completely just... kidding. I'm just going to troll the hell out of you, Ahad. Uh, you've already, you've already no, said it, man. Are, if they do that or the Levi with a blanket, I'm just going to freaking lose it. <laughs> yes, I hope they give him the blanket. Oh, I also hope they give him his leg back. <laughs> oh, All right, well, man. we're well, gonna end it here. Out wanna, of here, yeah. If you want to continue watching? We're gonna do our regularly scheduled podcast in forty-ish minutes here, so you can check oh, it out. Then. It'll be on Izakaya Studios, though. Yes. Yep. Mm, goodbye. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 bye.